Welcome to one and all present here. I am Sokti, Assistant Professor, Department of English, Kuch Bihar Ponchanon Borma University. On behalf of the Department of English, Kuch Bihar Ponchanon Borma University, I would like to welcome you all to the one national webinar on new humanities interplaying across disciplines. My heartfelt gratitude to the Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, Dr. Dev Kumar Mukhopadhyay, respected Registrar, sir, Dr. Abdul Kadir Shafili. Dean Faculty of Arts, Professor Madhav Chandra Odhikari, Dean of Science, Professor Prabir Kumar Haldar, HOD, Department of English, Dr. Sonak Samazdar, Professor Joita Sengupta, Mr. Soikot Sorkar, and other respected teachers and staff and all the participants who are present here. We are proud to announce that we have with us four eminent speakers across the nation for today's webinar. Professor D. Venkat Rao from the English and Foreign Languages University, Hyderabad, will deliver the keynote address. Uh, Dr. Abhishek Parui from IIT Madras, Dr. Umesh Patra from Mahatma Gandhi Central University, Dr. Parthasarthi Bhoumik from Jadavpur University. I'm sure you all have been eagerly waiting for this day. Now, I would like to request our Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, Dr. Dev Kumar Mukhopadhyay to deliver the inaugural speech and to grace the occasion. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Soikath. Thank you very much. At the very outset, I express my sincere thanks to you and Department of English for inviting me here in your this webinar. And uh, today's webinar, there are so many illuminaries who, who have taken trouble to be here for our students, teachers, scholars, and all the stakeholders. So on behalf of this university, I express sincere thanks to all four research persons who are here today. Thank you, sir, for your kind presence. Today is the World Environment Day, that is 5th June, we know. And this year, the theme is uh, mm, Reimagine, uh, recreate, and restore. This is the theme of to, to this year's uh, World Environment Day. Reimagine, recreate, and restore. And the global host of this day is Pakistan. And just a few words regarding this day that, you know, there is every three seconds the world loses enough forest to cover a football pitch and over the last century humans have destroyed half of the wetland as much as 50 percent of the coral reefs have already been lost and up to 90 percent of the coral reefs uh, could be lost by 2050 even if the global warming is limited to an increase of 1.5 degrees celsius this is the picture of today's uh, environment and uh, virtually in this beautiful day and when we remember when we work for our World Environment Day and this day has been chosen by you for discussing this important issue and it is very uh, novel one as because, um, as because I, I belong to economics discipline, economics world so I also have some experience regarding this matter. And uh, virtually uh, the humanities were the classical core of higher education. Through the 18th and 19th century, the ground of higher education were Greek and Latin. We know it. That started changing in the last 19th and early 20th century with the rise of most of our contemporary disciplines out of the invention of electives. But with the growing prestige of science and the expansion of higher education, the, after the World War, Second World War virtually, the humanities were considered a cornerstone essential to the development of any well-educated person whether 
is a uh, whether uh, he is a school teacher or a in an engineer or any person ah uh, could have undergraduate uh, training in this and virtually it was argued that humanities training uh, and study of this expression and it inculcates human inwardness virtually but with the passage of time this conventional humanities started facing questions many scholar address a question that the disciplinary boundaries of humanities denote a low a loose cluster of academic disciplines philosophy english computer liter comparative literature cultural studies even some scholars even are, are of the opinion that the humanities are dying and is replaced by a wave of hybrid fields such as digital humanities environmental humanities energy humanities global humanities medical humanities legal humanities public humanities in one word it is new humanities in literary studies histories we get some glimpses of digital humanities we may say that rabindranath tagore's novel had now become more popular than it was when from post because of this modern media and due to this modern media we can say that choker bali reached the doorstep of a driver it could not be thought at that time generally today department of english has organized this webinar and you all know that literature has a direct impact on the society in in various ways in aesthetic sense in practical sense last time uh, our department of english organized another uh, webinar just few, uh, one one week back on the rabindranath tagore that time i also told that the uh, was a impact of rabindranath tagore on the society so this impact has become more today has become more today due to this digital age perhaps the most socially concerned effort developed around the environmental humanities humanities environmental today is the i, I just at the very outset i mentioned about the today and world environment day and environmental humanities is another important subject drawing specially on the life and but also the but also the discipline like geology economics engineering it looks at the human aspects of environmental issues particularly climate change we may mention that the fact of construction of narmada dam yeah, we all know it regarding the construction of narmada dam and regarding the movement regarding the narmada dam we know the ecological impact on the society of the narmada dam so this type of new discipline marched i may also mention about the global humanities it underscores the pattern mm -hmm. of migration of people and networks around the world through which goods are manufactured and distributed and labor dispersed Migra just one example for example migration from bangladesh to india create different types of impacts on the society different types of impacts on the society whether it's economics whether it is sociology whether it is culture whether it is uh, population studies in all the fields there is some positive impact of this 
migration so this is another this is another field of new new uh, humanities and virtually you know the uh, just i i may i am suddenly today i am not a resource person just I am, my some my uh, uh, thoughts i just i like to share uh, for example two wings of new humanities have also developed in in medicine and law in medicine and law for example imagine progress and journals in the medical humanities medical humanities another term medical humanities bring humanistic perspective to medical education offering doctor and nurses the chance to explore ways of knowing beyond purely the scientific jargon we know it love and care with human touch by one medical person whether he is a nurse or a doctor even can create miracle what medicine cannot do that similarly legal humanities emphasizes on the fact that the law is never just a technical pursuit so many family problems are solved by the legal counseling by the judges that that your legal pursuit cannot solve it but other ways solve these problems it is our day to day uh, experience actually i will touch upon another aspect also there is some i think i am sure that today um, there are four uh, resource persons who are very much famous in their particular field and they will discuss this aspect also but i will touch upon one aspect that is it is called interdisciplinarity and it is interdisciplinarity the new humanities hit the call for interdisciplinarity that has sounded over the past many years bridging institutional boundaries conjoining otherwise details fields and sparring new knowledge and <clears throat> we tend to invoke interdisciplinarities as an inherently good thing but not all interdisciplinarities are alike the idea of interdisciplinarity assumes parity among disciplines it takes for granted that the university is composed of relatively equal autonomous areas that comprise a federated whole but the rise of the new humanities in fact believes a shift in the structure of the and that enables the applied disciplines or the entrepreneurial wings of other disciplines to dominate and often determine the focus of academic projects across the disciplines and uh, now i may i may uh, discuss regarding my fields also uh, for example uh, as because i am a student of economics i may mention some uh, example from economics also uh, there are so many persons who are uh, virtually now teachers of english also when they when they are students of undergraduate uh, as elective subject you must have read economics as your elective subject and there are so many concepts uh, regarding demand regarding supply demand regarding consumer behavior all these things and we used to read it we used to sit for examination all these things but you see all these things cannot say the reality of the economics in this real world you cannot see it you cannot say it for example for example from the point of view of population china is growing faster than india but there are so many problems that was solved by china but we cannot we could not do it and if you see the economic indicators 
you will see that the so many economic indicators in india that you could have reached some other peak by this time but you could not reach if you if, if we if the economists virtually are searching the reasons behind it why it was not possible then you will find some other things that it is not the economics but some other factors that determine the development of the society that determine the development of economic and social aspects of one country side by side economic theory economic theory some other concepts are there how people behave how people react how people accept how people uh, implement the government policies how people implement for example corona and when you when you, when we go out of home you will see that the uh, awareness among the people is not up to the mark and as because it is not up to the mark so this problem has not been solved till today but if you see some other countries and that you will see that they could they, they have solved the problem virtually it depends what i wanted to say that it is not only the theory it is not only the technical jargon it is not only the strict disciplinary jargon that can solve the issue of that bad very particular uh, 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 discipline that is the combination is required and i think this concept of new economy new humanities that's why has become so much important nowadays that's why so much important nowadays and they differ in uh, social stances too historically the traditional humanities presented an alternative to the commercial market seeing human values as more important than merchant values more recently cultural studies tend to criticize if not directly oppose the commercial market some wings of the new humanities like environmental uh, uh, humanities have affinities with the cultural okay. that is another part of the uh, of the uh, total discipline that is the new discipline of uh, new humanities however what is uh, 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 i should not extend my uh, um, uh, lecture uh, here just i have touched uh, some points regarding my views on this as aspect and uh, lastly just i want to say that this is the time that is the uh, stand alone policy stand alone policy uh, is not the only policy it is the time in some other way you can we may say that it is a team game it is a team game that team team game solve most of the problems that team game solves most of the uh, most of the uh, basic uh, problems of the society so i am sure uh, today's uh, webinar uh, and uh, virtually four resource persons who are very much famous in their own field will present thought provoking lectures and it will help our teachers our students and all the stakeholders who are today and on behalf of this university and on behalf of myself i express my sincere thanks to all who are here today to make this webinar a grand success and at the very last moment uh, to our uh, organizer especially shakti padu and department of english uh, thank you shakti for holding this type of beautiful seminar i think uh, you and your department uh, also uh, yesterday uh, shonak told me that uh, another webinar is going to be organized soon so it's really good that you are also organizing some good lectures thank you very much thank you thank you thank you shakti thank you sir for delivering the inaugural speech uh thank you so much for motivating us to organize this webinar now i'd like to introduce our 
keynote speaker of today's webinar. It's an honor and privilege to introduce the keynote speaker, my teacher, Professor D. Venkat Rao. Professor Rao teaches in the Department of English Literature at the English and Foreign Languages University, Hyderabad. A Fulbright Fellow and a reputed academician, Professor Rao is known for his extensive research in the field of digital passages of critical humanities. He has also received Commonwealth Academic Staff Scholarship in 1985, <coughs> as well as uh, Rockefeller Fellowship in 1993 and 97. His latest publications include Moving in the Double Bind, Reconfiguring Re Indian Critical and Reflective Traditions Today, Cultures of Memory in South Asia, Orality Literacy and the Problems of Inheritance from Springer, Critical Humanities from India, Context Issues Future from Rutledge. On behalf of the department, I'd like to thank you so much, sir, for joining us here today. We are eagerly waiting to listen to you. Over to you, sir. Thank you, um, Shakti. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, Shakti, um, for this wonderful uh, webinar. And uh, at the outset, I wish to thank your Vice Chancellor for that uh, uh, wonderful wide coverage and uh, opening up of several dimensions uh, and also pointing out very uh, the most critically important uh, issue. Um, and I, I think I would draw on that and then build the points that I wish to make today, that uh, the Environmental Day reminds us of uh, reimagining and also recreating and then restoring uh, the uh, habitats and the environment in which we live. These are very, very crucial points. And then I hope in the domain of humanities also, we need to think about that. I wish to thank uh, Shakti and also Dr. Saunak Majumdar, sorry, Samazdar, for making uh, this possible for me to participate in this webinar. Okay, yesterday when, when uh, Dr. Shakti contacted me, he informed me that uh, uh, the response to the webinar call was overwhelming. Now, this tells us two things. One is the, um, the extraordinarily important defiant spirit, resilient and defiant spirit, in spite of the prevailing and then raging pandemic, a large number of people, young people, uh, wish to make it a point to take part in this kind of life of the mind as it were. That's one. Second important thing is that the curiosity of many people to know and also to participate and to intervene. Um, this is something that is very heartening in this kind of situation. The context and also most of these people have come from various parts of, the, um, of our country. And this is very heartening. And then I wish to congratulate the department as well as Dr. Shakti for making this possible, uh, this interaction possible. I wish it could be a different kind, but the, the, the situation demands us that we meet virtually. And the virtual meeting has its own kind of uh, advantages. Uh, your Vice Chancellor, Professor uh, Mukhopadhyaya has already pointed out about the significance of the digital medium. I'll have a chance to talk about communication media soon. Okay, what I wish to share with you, basically I'm trying to share something with you. This is something that has unfolded in the course of teaching, in the course of a certain kind of inquiry, an inquiry conducted on my own individually, but also inquiry inquiries developed along with the students like Shakti and many others, okay? These inquiries I thought I should share with the young people and also colleagues and then contemporaries so that so that um, you know, insights from other places can come, which is very important. Those kind of insights, we need to be open to insights which come from other places, which is very, very crucial and very critical. For quite some time, in my own kind of um, uh, inquiries and teaching, research, and uh, working with students, I have always grappled with or confronted, uh, or a problem confronted me. This is the concept of tradition, uh, concept of context. The idea of the context, the context in which you're working, the context which makes you undertake certain kind of work. So this very notion, this very fundamental notion of context has become absolutely crucial. And this seems to be, this concept seems to me to be an open-ended notion. That is, you cannot put a closure, you cannot enclose it, the very notion of context. So what I wish to do <clears throat> for the rest of the discussion is basically unfold my understanding of this uh, notion of context and then see where this takes us. 
Now, as you can see, there is a, there are specific contexts that have brought us all together, whether virtually or really. One context is that that because of the prevailing pandemic situation, we could only have a webinar. Second important, that's a context. Second important context is that this webinar is taking place through very, very particular kind of communicational context, which is the digital medium. These are providing other context, but there is much more crucial, something much more interesting and important notion of the context that unfolds and that constitutes our meeting here, which is we to a large extent belong to or share certain things which are created by a particular context. And that context is academia. We are all academics, are your students, are teachers, or, or researchers, uh, and all these things probably. And uh, these, uh, these have brought us together. Now let's unfold this very notion of the context uh, a little more. What I'd like to do is that share with you a certain set of slides uh, so that you know what I'm talking about can become a little more uh, clear. Give me one sec. Okay, is the screen visible? Yes, sir. All right. One sec, it's not visible to me. Give me one sec. Okay, now let's let's expand. I began with the notion of the context and let's, let's expand it a little and then see where it takes us. Context, one can talk about context in terms of a, a certain kind of convergence of any formation. Look, we all have come, those of us who are taking part in this webinar, we all have come from various kinds of places. We are all formations of human beings or human you know, or, organisms, if you like. And there are a set of relations, you're a teacher, you're a student, or you're a researcher, you know? So a, a, a context is a convergence. It enables the, you know, kind of coming together of certain kind of formations and, and also a certain kind of reception. It provides a context for receiving, understanding, receiving, grasping something. It is also a condition of, it, it provides a condition of possibility. Suppose you receive something, you listen to something, then there is a possibility of your response. And I'm hoping that there'll be responses to whatever I'm going to share with you. Now, every reception, that is to say, a context provides a condition, a condition for a condition and a possibility to receive something. And the reception always implies a certain kind of response. And also every response implies within it, or it should contain a sense of responsibility as well. When I'm responding, I'm responsible to the response that I'm providing. That is something that needs to be remembered. So um, a context is that which brings together formations in our specific situation. Here, the formations are students and teachers, okay? And then an event. An event, what I mean by an event is that they something at, at uh, something that takes place in a particular kind of situation. And what takes place when you come to the university is the teaching and learning, they ought to take place. They take place, okay? And then what is it that teaching is about? The teaching is about, for our purposes, those of us who are attending this seminar and this, uh, this webinar itself is organized around this particular theme. We engage in the question of teaching and learning with regard to a particular discourse called literature. And I, I would like to include within the notion of literature, as I will elaborate later, philosophy as well. So the, the, the context that we are in, the context that brings us together, a set of people, as a, an expectation of an event and a certain kind of discourse. Another important thing is that such a kind of discourse, such a kind of event could not have taken place outside a particular context, another context, which is the institutional context. Only a university could have organized an academic webinar. And that's why it's a, institution is another kind of context. So university, but in the university also, there is a particular kind of medium we get exposed to. So a context is formed by a certain kind of formations, students and teachers, a certain kind of event, an expectation is there that teaching takes place, learning takes place, inquiry takes place. 
and it takes place within a particular kind of discourse called literature or philosophy for our purposes okay if you happen to be in social sciences maybe you would engage with economics or anthropology or any other kind of some other discourse and this can take place only in an institution called the university it can't take place in a railway station or in an airport it can take place it has meaning this language has meaning only in that particular context called the institutional context and also it takes place in a particular through a particular medium and i describe this as inscription we will elaborate that a little further now in our situation and in our context and what i mean by in our context is that in the indian context of the university where the discourses take place where the events of teaching and learning take place in our context this is the proposition i am making and i'm whatever i'm going to say will be provocative so that uh, an inquiry a conversation can take place okay so in our context that is the indian context but this can be extended to other other places also um the context of production gets privileged or dominates over the context of reception that is to say a context which creates a certain kind of discourses a context which creates a certain kind of institutions and a certain kind of privileges a certain kind of medium they tend to get privilege they tend to dominate over the context which receives them so there is a certain kind of asymmetric relationship between context of production and context of reception that's the situation that's the context in which you and me i assume that most of this most of the webinar participants are from indian background i i pitch my argument on the base of that if there are people from other places we can modify this argument okay so the context in which we are located is a context which is which is uh, you know kind of uh, uh, there's a it sets an asymmetric relationship between what i'm calling as context of product what i'm calling what i'm describing as context of production and context of reception now here what is the context of production in our case the context of production is something that has been created by europe or the west and uh, um the the entire discourse or the event of teaching the discourse of humanities and the concept of the university and the and the medium that gets actually privileged from the context of production are all all those which have emerged from the west today the west and europe a european west is the context of production which generates these structures and then they get um, imparted to a context of reception what is the context of reception in our situation india suppose we are from africa i would say africa but we are from india here right now so indian students and from india teachers institutions we also have institutions these universities have been implanted historically and then our native languages these are the contexts of reception you come from bangla background or you come from kannada background or madi odia or marathi background that is your context of reception in that context of reception you happen to receive the discourse of humanities literature and philosophy so there is a certain kind of asymmetric relationship between these two that's what i'm trying to point out okay give me one sec so when these contexts interface i am pointing out that there are two contexts one is the context of production and the other is the context of reception in both these places there are students institutions and discourses but there is a kind of asymmetric relationship hierarchic relationship between context of production and context of reception this is something that prevails in the indian context and also in most of the contexts where cultures have faced colonialism for more than a more than a century in all those contexts there is this asymmetric relationship that continues to prevail even to this day as we are speaking today okay so the question that comes up here is that how did these contexts interface at some point historically they might have interacted with each other context of production on the one hand and context of reception on the other in our case how did europe when it came to india interface with india and and how did india receive europe when europe invaded india this question comes up how did uh, what kind of response came from india did it understand what europe was doing and did europe understand what it was doing when it entered the indian context now my claim is that the, there is a and uh, many of you might have uh, thought about this the interface the interaction between alleged interaction between india and europe 
from the 19th century onwards or even earlier, <clears throat> it sets up an asymmetric relationship between Europe and India. Okay, the reason is that the very concept of the discourse, that is what should be taught, and the concept of the institution where it should be taught, and the medium through which it should be taught, and the very notion of event called teaching, how teaching should take place. All these structures and concepts have been designed, developed, calculatively from the context of production, that Europe creates these things and then implants them, transfers them, exports them to colonies. And, the, and we receive them, we sort of implant them, we kind of, you know, kind of you, um, make ourselves over into those structures. So what happens when such a kind of interaction takes place? When, when Europe interacted with India, India was not some kind of a, 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 a kind of a surface without anything as such. It's not an empty surface. It was not a vacuum. Something existed here for, for more than millennia, several millennia. So what happens in this interaction is that existing formations and the ways of learning that were prevalent, either they get discarded or they get marginalized, or they get stigmatized. That is to say, when Europe comes to India, whatever it sees prevailing there, what the modes of learning, the materials of learning, and the, and the institutions of learning, they either get discarded, or they get marginalized, okay? So the interface between Europe and India establishes a certain kind of structural asymmetry. This is a structural one, not an individual one. It's not out of a voluntary choice, but it is structurally you know, implanted. And um, so this takes place through a certain kind of educational program and the law and the educational program that came into existence and which actually, you know, enabled this particular kind of transmission of European structures of production is called the humanities. That's the, 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 that's the particular kind of context in which we are functioning today. A context which has been entirely created by European background and that particular kind of structure comes in and it gets implanted here and within which we are we continue to function today. And what it does is that the context of production marginalizes and then so quite often stigmatizes the context of reception. The context, the assumption here is that the context of reception will have to simply follow uh, whatever comes from the context of production. Okay. So generally the, uh, the, the, sort of frame under which the humanities discourses get celebrated and transmitted or that humanities deals with the, the, the domain of humanities deals with human thought, human ideas, human re reflection, creativity, and the human action in specific kind of habitats, in specific kind of locations. Okay. So, uh, and also it comes through uh, human reflection takes place by means of very specific kind of cultural technologies. I'll be talking a little more about the cultural technologies soon. So what humanities deals or ought to deal with, or you know, it is supposed to be dealing with is that it basically deals with our practices and our thoughts about our practices, what we say or what we do, okay? This is what the humanities uh, is supposed to deal with, okay? And this particular kind of thinking, uh, this gets kind of, uh, um, one sec. And these, these kind of discourses get institutionalized and students are trained year after year, you know, decade after decade. And this particular kind of structure continues to re regenerate, reproduce itself. And that's the situation in which you find ourselves. Today, the entire field of humanities, the entire conceptual formation of the humanities, in other words, the discourses that we are talking about and the concepts that we are talking about, that is to say, what does it mean to be human? Who is a human being? The concept of literature, the concept of art, the concept of philosophy, the concept of aesthetics, culture, religion, comparison, translation. You take any singular concept that prevails in the field of humanities today, every single one of them has come from Europe. It's a European concept, but we continue to talk about it. We talk about Indian literature. We talk about Indian aesthetics. We talk about many things like Indian art. There are no Indian concepts of art. 
there are no indian concepts upon every in the last 100 years if you i have under if you inquire into the kind of discourses that have emerged about indian art you will begin to see that each one of them has derived from european concepts so the entire grid of humanities that is at work today in the universities which we continue to teach year after year is a grid which has been created elsewhere from a different kind of context and we continue to privilege that particular context in other words even if we are indians we are actually privileging what europe has done and that is the situation in which we are okay so what happens what are the cons what's the consequence of this we are getting jobs we are uh, flourishing in the universities we are increasing the universities what's the problem what results from this is is a certain kind of psychic disjuncture takes place your own reflection your own way of bringing you the the way you have been brought up through certain kind of cultural forms and cultural media they get marginalized or they get transformed into the european structures of thinking as a result there is a psychic disjuncture the english language that we speak and the in the research questions that we tend to ask they generate a psychic disjuncture between your experience on the one hand and your educational model on the other hand and this psychic disjuncture will have serious consequences as a result i'm sorry to say most of the research that goes on in the humanities and social sciences is a completely derivative research that's at work today in most of the universities 99.9% of the researches that are done in the universities or the researches we simply replicate ideas which have come from elsewhere and that's the kind of situation in which we are today okay so we try to understand when we are talking about um when we talk about ourselves that is to say indians we depend on the structures of interpretation structures of understanding discourses of uh, discourses of explanation which have been generated from elsewhere and then we tend to kind of import them tending to think that this is going to explain what we are doing that's a that's the sorry situation in which we are today these have become a certain kind of um, you know obligations for us it is by it's kind of necessary as if as it were to present ourselves in this particular way okay but the concept of now we are making another claim the claim that we are making is that the very con, the claim that we made so far is that that the concept of humanities and what all the baggage it creates and carries is a production of europe and what europe produces gets transmitted implanted and then it gets it gets institutionalized and that creates a certain kind of psychic disjuncture okay now the second claim that i am making is that the concept is the humanities is not Uh, and the entire conceptual grid is not universal you, uh, i mean this is a classroom exercise you can also think on your own what are the equivalent words for religion in your languages you won't find them you might say dharma and matha that they, these terms do not be uh, they do not become equivalent okay at all okay this can be further taken up you can you say what's the equivalent term called we immediately say that kala is the equivalent of art no it doesn't work okay kala means sanskrit today we are using it talks about kala okay as if art as if there is an aesthetic rasa is considered to be an aesthetic category no it is not so you when you begin to these concepts you will begin to see that there is an abyssal difference between what you has created and what indian you know, terms indicate or what indian experience as you and this has become a certain kind of um, uh, the grid has been the grid of concepts like art aesthetics etc that has been turned into a kind of universal one but it is, we need to begin to realize that it is not necessarily universal that is to say european experience is not necessarily the experience of the rest of the planet the planet has different kind of cultures and they think in very different ways so a new category that comes into existence in 150 years is the category called european the non european category is essentially a category created by europe as europe designates a group of people who are non europeans in the sense that those who are not like europe they should be like europe and those categories those kind of categories of people are are non european if you look at some of the contemporary work the argument is you know sort of uh, vigorously put forward by serious european scholars today okay they in context the universities are very prepared 
to confront this particular kind of asymmetric structure which we perpetrate in our universities okay this particular kind of uh, uh, asymmetry is going to be it will have it has already yielded very detrimental results but it will continue to have both psychic and other kind of consequences in 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 the context and we are witnessing them every institution is collapsing in india judiciary about our background now that's another kind of inquiry so two kind of inquiries will have to go on europe must be explored to understand europe and its background which enables europe to ask a set of questions at the same time indian background through indian cultural forms that is something that we need to uh, that kind of risky inquiry must be made but this risky inquiry i'm calling it risky because <clears throat> this inquiry when you inquire into indian background it's not aimed at pointing out that uh, you know your culture is superior to other cultures that's going to be a silly inquiry okay that's not going to be helpful that's not going to be a productive one so without such kind of ethnicist culturalist alibis we should be able to undertake that so how do we find out cultural difference i pointed out that we need to as researchers as inquirers and teachers as students we need to explore cultural difference how does the west think and how does the non west think how does how do let's say in our case how does europe think and how do we think okay that exploration must go on cultural difference how do we explore the cultural difference one of the ways one of the strategies and which is becomes partly productive in our own inquiries we have been able to do some work in the last 15 20 years is to pay attention to communicational media cultural media okay and uh, every culture irrespective of which part of the planet you are talking about whether you are talking about eskimos or amazonians or whether you are talking about you know europeans or anyone okay every culture the very idea of culture itself manifests in terms of a communicational media what we mean by that is that either they they speak or they tell story or they sing a song at the rock painting these are all communicational media okay what are these communicational media in which cultural forms come into existence so the point i'm making i hope you're able to see in the asymmetric relationship that europe establishes in that context we need to explore cultural difference and one of the ways of exploring these cultural differences by paying attention to the communicational media that a culture depends on in order to create its cultural forms what kind of cultural forms are privileged in europe what kind of cultural forms are prevalent in a case like india that is some that's an inquiry that one can undertake what are these different cultural forms cultural media it is possible to explore the entire the so called hominid or human history on the basis of changing communicational systems these are about yeah um these are about five distinctive kind of cultural media or communication systems one can think about these are cultural technologies that is that anything that you can think in terms of a cultural form will have to depend on either of any of these kind of communicational systems okay the first one we do not know when it began the first one um, you know is described as oral and gestural and the second one is tribal oral and gestural is when you tell a story or sing a song or dance these are the cultural forms that come into existence they prevailed for a long time for for millennia they prevailed and they were displaced by scribal communication system where writing begins to become important and then that gets displaced in the 15th century by print medium uh um, and then it develops distinctive kind of cultural forms again and that also gets short lived that becomes short lived and it gets displaced by audio visual communication system in the 19th century where camera and cinema become very important the new cultural form that comes into existence is film and that begins to displace uh, the print cultural medium and today we are in the in the dominant cultural media cultural communication medium called uh, 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 the digital medium okay and this is this is every cultural form that one can think about can be articulated in terms of this new medium new cultural medium so each each of these communication systems was dominant at one point and it created and determined the idea of um, idea of learning ideas of wisdom idea of knowledge idea of creativity and anything that you can think about you will be a knowledgeable person you will be a creative person only when you draw when only when you articulate when you say something express something create a form 
on the, uh, in the dominant communicational medium. So in a scribal communication system, you must be a poet, you will become a poet only when you write something, handwritten one, okay? In the print medium, it is the novel which becomes the most important kind of com communication, uh, cultural form, okay? In the audiovisual <clears throat> uh, dominant communication system, film becomes the most supreme cultural medium. In the context of uh, digital technology, we are yet to know which is the dominant one. Each one of these communication systems has advantages and limitations, okay? And the advantages are that all this scribal to digital will tell you that we preserve, we make something which has come into existence immortal by recording it. They're all recording material, recording media, scribal to digital. You kind of record that and you preserve it for the posterity. Whereas the oral and gestural, the argument goes, the oral and gestural are ephemeral. Once they are uttered and rendered, they disappear. This is the standard argument that we come across quite often, okay? Now, these communication media can be further divided into inscriptional medium on the one hand and what I call pneumocultural medium on the other. Pneumocultures are cultures of memory. The, where the memory gets articulated by means of the body and the bodily uh, you know, endowments where memory prefers to get articulated entirely by means of the body and body endowments, that is, they are called the Nemo cultures. The other cultures which make use of inscription, yeah, which make use of recording, which depend on what can be called, which create surrogate bodies, they're all called inscriptional technologies or inscriptional media, okay? So, scribal to digital is inscriptional medium and oral is Nemo cultural medium. So there's a distinction between these two. Cultures which have created their cultural forms uh, by drawing on Nemo cultures, they depend on the body. Body become, play, begins to play a central role. It is through the articulations of the body and the nuanced articulations of the body, cultural forms come into existence. Whereas the inscriptional forms, body becomes lesser and less, lesser, uh, is of lesser importance. Because what becomes important is that whatever the body articulates, recording that, transferring that to a permanent alternative body. The alternative body is the, is the surrogate body, okay? Body gets, begins to get displaced and surrogate bodies begin to take place, okay? As a result, you have the libraries, <clears throat> you have the archives, you have the museums, you have the digital databases. All these are inscriptional media and inscriptional institutions. Whereas Nemo cultures, all the time, every time you have to render a particular culture form, you put your body to work. There's an extraordinary significance and consequences to these dif distinctive kind of cultural forms. So in order to understand a cultural difference, the cultural difference between Europe and India, the point, uh, the, I mean, the, a certain kind of opening for further research and inquiry, what I'm suggesting is that if we put emphasis on, if we pay, pay attention to the, the dominant cultural media or the particular kind of cultural medium which a particular culture gives preference to. Here I'm making a stake. I'm making another kind of claim that for a long time, for millennia, Indian cultural forms tended to depend on Nemo cultures. For a long time, they continue to be so for a, an extraordinary period of time and they continue to be so um, through an extraordinary range of uh, uh, locations, even to this day. Whereas European one, it is the inscriptional medium which began to dominate. It is not the nemocultural medium. Nemocultural medium gets displaced. Inscriptional medium begins to become important. That's why in the interface between Europe and India, it is the inscriptional medium, whether it is print or writing uh, or audiovisual, they began to dominate. Our university is an inscriptional medium completely, thoroughly, truly, uh, uh, through and through. When the inscriptional medium meets Nemo cultures, what, what happens is that the projection of inscriptionality over the Nemo culturality takes place. That is to our understanding of cultures of uh, memory tend to be dominated by the experience of the inscriptional medium. In other words, in order to understand Nemo cultures, we depend quite often only on the experience of the culture which, be, which became 
which gave which began to give importance to inscriptionality that is european experience and european understanding as a result even to this day right now as i'm speaking to you um as i'm speaking to you the extant work on memory cultural memory the entire work theoretical work that is available uh, today is dominated by european experience of european culture and no other culture becomes important there all the other cultures which are studied african or other kind of cultures that are studied they are studied on the basis of european experience in other words what happened in europe that becomes the model to understand every culture so in the european case nemo cultures or cultures of memory are displaced systematically they get displaced and then uh, a certain kind of psychic transformation is assumed when inscriptionality develops it is assumed that it is going to bring forth some radical change in the mind of the people and on the basis of that uh, nemo culturality is either uh, you know kind of repressed or marginalized this is something this can be explored very clearly and then uh, more productively when we begin to engage with very specific cultures okay so today the 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 framework that is available to us is that this is what we are suggesting from our research that um, communicational media or cultural media can be divided into lithic and alithic alithic cultures are those which do not require any kind of substrate on which they are going to inscribe their memory that is to say an alternative body on which they are going to express their memories or are they going to record their memories such cultures are alithic cultures lithic cultures are those which have taken to inscription they require substrates they require alternative bodies in which memory is recorded and preserved over a long period of time as a result whoever has whoever has the power to control dominate and then take over these alternative bodies will be the dominant person in a particular kind of culture and society culture or society whereas the nemo cultures not everybody and uh, nobody can dominate your memory because your your memory is being articulated by your body so today the extant uh, critical work that's available theoretical work that's available it's amazing to see from plato to uh, bernard stiegler the work that is available today it tells you entirely european experience or european experience of other cultures and that's the situation in which we are where exactly we need newer researches and newer kind of um, uh, new kind of inquiries are necessary okay um now this is an example i'm giving but i won't have chance to talk a lot more about this on the basis of this particular idea that cultural difference can be explored on the basis of the privilege that is given to a particular kind of cultural medium whether it is nemo cultural or whether it is inscriptional on the basis of that if we begin to examine greek past you will begin to see how the transformation has taken place or how the transformation has been determined in the subsequent period when a uh, greek culture is supposed to have changed from nemo culturality to uh, inscriptionality and as a result of which greek culture becomes a model for the rest of humanity that is that once you give up your memory embodied memory or an active memory your memory begins to open up rationality legal systems grammar and it change it changes your consciousness all these are attributed to inscriptionality inscription becomes privileged medium okay whereas whereas cultural experience of india defies that completely okay even without inscription extraordinary kind of works have been done in indian culture panini did not need writing panini sashya jai if is you are a good teacher you don't need to you don't need to depend on a you know um, an inscriptional that is a textbook you remember all the sutras and then you teach so uh, um, ganita jyotisha astronomy uh, for a long time for centuries moved on the basis of non inscriptional medium non inscriptional modes in the indian context in other words extraordinary inquiries and extraordinary work has been done without taking recourse to inscriptionality whereas european culture tends to point out that unless you have writing you cannot have grammar you cannot have law you cannot have rationality you cannot have logic none of those things are possible this is explained by examining uh, uh, greek culture but it is it should be possible to um, have a different kind of approach 
to European European understanding of European past, which can, need not be the universal one. So uh, it is from that understanding, European understanding of European past, that we begin to see a particular kind of concept of literature gets established. Literature is the concept of literature is not traced back to Greece in, in a major argument that uh, a contemporary philosopher like Derrida develops. He says that the concept of literature could not have come into existence from, uh, uh, from Greek past, but it could, it could come into existence only from Judaic past. This is the argument, major argument that Derrida develops. And the argument continues in, um, in Christianity in the subsequent period. In the 18th century, this argument gets powerfully theorized by, um, by, by the major philosopher Kant and the concept of literature that gets, that gets established by the end of 18th century, especially through the contribution of uh, 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 Kant. And this contribution is largely a kind of engagement with the Greek past and displacement of the Greek past. Why is it the Greek past cannot provide a concept of literature? Why is it only a Judeo-Christian culture can provide a concept of literature? Is something that when we engage with, I mean, I could have gone on more about this, but time doesn't permit me. Um, uh, why is it Judeo-Christian culture alone can consolidate a concept of literature? Uh, is something that, that we begin to see in the work of both Kant on the one hand, and also more elaborately and more you know, kind of formidably developed by Derrida. Derrida clearly says that by definition, the concept of literature is something that cannot be found in non-European cultures. It's a, it's a concept that could be seen only in Europe. And it traces it back to Judaic uh, past, especially to this kind of religious theological relationship between Abraham on the one hand and God on the other hand, as a certain kind of pact that takes place with God, between God and Abraham on the basis of that, uh, you know, he says, he tends to think, he tends to argue that the concept of literature has emerged, okay? This this requires, I'm being unfair, this requires much more elaboration, but that would require more time. And then it would take us away from the topic that we are uh, dealing with today, which is critical humanities. So, um, so in the last 2000 years, what we, have begin to, what we begin to notice when we explore Europe more and more, European culture has been shaped by, European culture has been determined by, to a very large extent, internally context, contested positions of Judeo-Christianity. There are three major strands which constitute European culture, which is Greek past, Greek or Latin past, second is Judaic past, third is Christianity with internal variations, okay? But if you look at European thinkers who are arguing today, they are always very, very deeply, you know, kind of antagonistic positions with regard to which particular strata, whether it is a Greek strata or Judaic strata or Christian strata, which is important. But today, the argument that prevails today more powerfully is that uh, European culture is Christian to a very large extent. We are Christians. Our thought is Christian, declares this contemporary philosopher, called uh, Jean-Luc Nancy. He says that uh, we are through and through Christians and our thinking is Christian, okay? So every concept that is available to us today can be traced back to the concept of uh, aesthetic. The concept of aesthetic that uh, Kant develops is a completely theological concept. The concept of aesthetic, concept of uh, art, all these concepts have emerged from that particular kind of background. What they tried to do in the 18th century is to secularize what is prevalent, uh, predominantly a religious or theological culture. And they get institutionalized. And we tend to think that these are part of our own culture. Our culture can be understood on the basis of these particular kind of um, categories and concepts. There is no concept that, uh, in the, I mean, there are, there's poetry. Nobody is denying that there's poetry and drama that is written for millennia in the Indian context. But nobody has come up with the idea to describe what is literature, the concept of literature, do, we do not come across a, a definitive standardized canonical definition of what a poem is, what a kavya is. Yeah, if you look at Alankara Shastra, which spread over 1500 years, you'll begin to see very fascinating domain. You'll begin to see that one contests with the other, but you don't have a centralized concept, something equivalent to what you find in Europe. 
Okay, so I think this cries out for newer inquiries, newer researchers to understand your own culture on the basis of the kind of, on the basis of the communicational media or cultural media, your culture, you know, prefers on the basis of that further explorations can take place. Okay. We come, when we come to India, I have already talked about I, I, two points I was making. Caught in the double bind, we need to make a double move. One move is that try and then know Europe on the base of European cultural forms. Europe needs to be known from European thinking and not in order to apply, not in order to kind of replicate what Europe thinks uh, as universal, but to understand Europe, okay? And then the second move that I suggested was that that we should take the risk and then inquire into what we consider to be India is, okay? And the basis of this kind of inquiry, the one source through which, one way through which this kind of inquiry can, can be moved is to focus upon the communicational media. And uh, the claim that I'm making is that to a large extent, for a very, for millennia, Indian traditions have been pneumocultural. That is that they're body-oriented, they, their cultural forms manifest in terms of embodied and enacted kind of articulations. The body becomes the central thing and the sub and the surrogate bodies, the text or archive or library, they do not become very significant at all for a very long time. Okay. So embodied memory becomes important, not the inscriptional memory. Inscriptional memory draws on surrogate bodies. Okay. So when you look at as a sketch to, to see the validity of the point that I'm making, if you look at the Sanskrit, uh, uh, you know, literary traditions, the entire Vangmaya, you'll begin to see that memory manifests in terms of um, uh, uh, extraordinarily spread out genres. Okay, these are Sruti genres and Spruti genres. You know, that is to say, the Puranas, the Kavyas, the, um, uh, the you know, Itihasas, whole range of things. And you know, many of you are familiar with that. All these, even to this day, are recited, enacted performed. That's what we see even to this day, okay? That itihasas are rendered, Ramayana stories are performed, Ramayanas are sung, Puranas are episodes of Puranas, Palas, as you say, uh, in in uh, in the context of show performance, okay? Which Shakti has worked on. And these are all Natya, dances, and then the uh, drama, Kavya, these are all recited. One of the important things that Kavya may be written, but the significance of kavya is in the in the in the uh, in the uh, singing of it in the madhurya you know the the uh, the, the kind of delicateness of it the kind of beauty of the sweetness of that okay the kavya's beauty comes out only when you when there is a, a beautiful voice or very delectable voice is articulating it such a culture, such cultural forms. I mean, you can, I'm just only touching the tip of the iceberg. Itihasas, Puranas are the forms through which you will see storytelling traditions, singing traditions, and performative traditions proliferating across India, everywhere. And the major contributors to that are Sutta, the storyteller, are, are Vyasa, and, uh, and Vyasa's own, uh, you know, kind of progeny. Bharata, Bharata means two things, both Bharata is Nat Shastra, but Bharata is a performer, a dancer, and seer, seer is the sage Valmiki. Through these kind of trio, you'll begin to see extraordinary proliferation of cultural forms, cultural forms which are basically nemo-cultural. They are based on memory, the memory that is enacted, memory that is put into work by means of the body. Another important thing is that this, this is something extraordinarily unique in the Indian context. All the cultural forms that are available to us today, they're all cultural forms directly connected with very specific kind of cultural formations. And what I mean by cultural formation here is that jatis. Jatis, this becomes a controversial theme, but it's important to talk about it. In the Indian context, I would claim that if there is something like culture and that, that something called culture is made possible even to this day by the jatis. If you don't have jatis, you don't have cultures. You don't have culture in India. Take any particular kind of cultural form from any region of the country, you'll begin to see that that particular cultural form is something, is a preserve, is guarded by very specific kind of jatis. 
they are the custodians they are the they are the creators and custodians and disseminators of that particular cultural form any part of india you can go to i'm sure each one of you he, this is where your context becomes important the context the location from where you are coming and you will begin to understand that all the song traditions that your father grandfather and then relatives are involved in are they familiar with they all have come from very distinctive kind of jatis and the jatis are the custodians there is no centralized institution for culture in the indian context there isn't anything there is no centralized text as in the context of judeo christianity where the bible and the church become very important okay there is nothing of that kind you have your own gods you have your own cuisine you are you have your own rituals you have your own practices you have your own language you have your own distinctive cultural forms these cultural forms are absolutely important you cannot rule out you cannot take them away chow from mayurbhanj a chow from purulia you can't take it away okay that distinctive cultural form generated sustained by these particular communities same is the case with if you go to khasi hills or if you go to if you go to manipur you will find uh maibi culture and maiba culture very very distinctive kind of cultural forms sustained by very specific kind of communities but our understanding of jati our understanding of caste has been has been completely distorted by european understanding of caste and european understanding of jati europe cannot understand what jati is but it has imported it has kind of imposed a particular explanation on that and that explanation becomes dominant among the educated people mostly and not among the non educated people a large number of people who sustain these kind of cultural forms they 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 are absolutely comfortable with this this is not to say that there is no oppression in this culture not at all i'm not making that claim i what i'm pointing there is no culture where there is no oppression by the way so but the point that we are trying to make is that something called jati and its contribution to the culture and the creation of cultural forms is so colossal that if you want to be a serious student of humanities you cannot but focus attention on that what are the forms cultural forms that are available who are the creators of these cultural forms who disseminate them what is the idiom that they use what kind of language that they use how did they differ from each other how did they sustain them what kind of creativity is at work what are the ways in which these cultural forms are brought forward how do we take them further these are the questions absolutely crucial questions in my view as long as we don't undertake that kind of uh, inquiry which is very close to us only we have been distanced from it for the last what four three four generations depending on the place where you are depending on the place where you come from okay so if you begin to uh, pay attention to that the song tradition the voice tradition the percussionist tradition yeah the 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 uh, pravachana tradition the 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 parayana tradition these are all you know kind of extraordinarily spread out and they are all throbbing they are all alive but the student of humanities runs after something else because of this psychic disjunction that is at work here okay jatis are very peculiar they are internally self differentiating jatis cannot be unified by the way jatis cannot be unified they are all internally differentiated they differentiate themselves constantly internally and a new jati comes into existence a new culture form may also come into existence okay so these are jati jatis are what i'm calling biocultural formations you are born into a jati you carry on the cultural forms of that particular jati and that they create jatis create cultural forms and they in fact carry on what i call lively archives lively archives are that the person who is capable of singing and performing he doesn't need a book he doesn't need a video he just performs year after year whenever you ask him to perform seasonally he would perform because the memory is in the embodied memory is in the body and the body in the particular context becomes it comes lively and it starts articulating and then performing you can you can go across any part of india and explore that you will begin to see that okay this is something very peculiar but we as students of literature and humanities we have been distanced from that there are other kind of i'm not sure how much time do you have uh, shakti shall i stop uh, no sir you can go on okay so, i'm from uh, let me see uh, how much uh, 
I'm, I'll try to wind it up. Another 10 minutes, is that okay? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, they, these are all research questions that I'm posing. These are going to be provocative, but without provocation, there's no research, there's no inquiry. We need to explore this both individually and collectively because we come from those backgrounds. Indian classroom is an extraordinary opportunity, an extraordinary classroom. It is never a homogeneous classroom. When you go to the classroom, you know that and you don't know that. We don't talk about it. We suppress it. Yeah, because our own kind of, uh, you know, un unexamined guilt that that forces us to suppress the idea of jati. Your classroom is a heterogeneous classroom. It is composed of students from multiple jatis and teachers from multiple jatis. They have their own background. They Their backgrounds have generated extraordinarily compelling cultural forms. They participated in them. They circulated them. They created them. They sustained them. So, but we do not want to talk about them at all for the simple reason that, you know, oh my God, you can't talk about jati, okay? So this is, a, this is in the last 100, 150 years, this particular tendency has become very powerful. And this has dominated the 3000 years of memory that continues to thrive. So if one has to talk about Indian tradition and Indian culture, we need to talk about the heterogeneity of cultural forms. The heterogeneity of the cultural forms is made possible by the heterogeneity of cultural formations. Okay, so there is, I mean, we can we can go into a lot more detail and then talk about this, but we don't have time. I'm only introducing this idea to you at this stage, and um, and hopefully we will be able to uh, uh, take this up further in in the in the discussions. Okay, Indian tradition again, uh, Indian scenario throws up major challenges, where and, and strange kind of paradoxes. Okay. It doesn't. It doesn't theorize. Indian traditions don't theorize. They seem to. They seem to move on the basis of a certain kind of replenishing, transforming the practices. There are certain kind of practices that have been handed down to you by tradition. You bring in changes in the in the practices as the practices are put to work constantly on the run, as it were. Okay. We don't undertake. You know what is a kavya? What is a dharma? Such kind of, uh, uh, you know, um, theorizing uh, impulses are not there. When you go to Manu, Manu tells you that <clears throat> Achara Paramo Dharma. Among all the dharmas, Achara is the Paramo Dharma. What is Achara? Achara is practice. Practice, continuing practice, internally transformed constantly over a period of time. So there is no canonical normative understanding of dharma. So similarly, you do not have a normative understanding of something like poetry. Take, for instance, Mamata in the 14th century, 13th century says, what is a kavya? He, he doesn't ask that question, but kavya is this, he says. What is that? Niyati krita niyama rahitam ananna paratantranam. What does that mean? It is written according to a certain kind of rules, but it doesn't abide by any rule. Niyati krita, krita means creation. Niyama Rahitam, it doesn't have any kind of, you know, rigid rules. That's what Kavya is. Ananya Paratantranam, it doesn't depend on anything else. That is what Kavya is. Okay. So you can go to any domain, any domain, sculpture, painting, any domain, you'll begin to see that such kind of normative canonical ideas are not there. Yet the work goes on. Okay. Interesting kind of practitional work goes on. So it raises very serious kind of questions, okay? And take take another domain like image making. For about nearly 2000 years, there were no, there is no plastic arts in India. There was no images, there were no images. Images began to emerge in the, only in the post-Ashokan period, post-Ashokan period. By then the culture, cultural development and cultural thinking has extraordinarily proliferated and, and then spread across, okay? Consolidated and spread across. But once the images began to come up, they began to throw up new kind of challenges, okay? The temple culture uh, spread across in the common era, okay? So the question comes up, why is it this culture did not take recourse to image making? It's not Jew it is not like Jewish culture. Jewish culture will tell you, thou shalt not create given images. We don't have an injunction like that. So Indian culture poses, you know, deep fundamental kind of challenges. And these challenges will have to be taken up by us, you and me. Our institutions, whatever these institutions are, implanted by Europe and the problems that they create, in spite of that, we should learn to forge, prepare, create new questions by looking around, 
by paying attention to our experience the psychic disjuncture takes place because we dissociate our experience from our education our education is something which tells you that look for uh, you know look for ways of applying what europe has told you that is what is going to aggravate the psychic difference and that's the problem that we are facing today so we need a different kind of approach to the problem the enigmas continue sanskrit spread across for millennia but sanskrit never translated you do not find sanskrit translating for a very long time for a very very long time yeah but sanskrit gets translated in other words the cultural forms that existed in sanskrit they get translated but sanskrit it does itself doesn't get translated doesn't translate that's why you don't find even though there was an interaction with um uh your interaction uh, interaction with chinese culture and other culture, korean culture but that does not uh, lead to translation of uh, korean or chinese uh, works into india okay so there are many many questions that come up today the major challenge that is posed to us in the humanities departments and not just in humanities is that the guardians of memory who are the cultural custodians from different kind of jatis these guardians who have sustained this memory cultural memory for millennia they keep on looking at us and they keep on asking the question do you understand us do you know what we have done and today unfortunately the university is not preparing ourselves our students and our researchers to confront those questions not by simply turning them into folklore the most kind of uh, terrible kind of discipline turning these into folklore our grandfather and father are not folk for us if they are folk who are you and me okay i come from a jati my grandfather used to sing or he was a percussionist from let's say chamar community i can't say that my father is a folk but i am elite that's the that's the violence that european knowledge systems have created what instead of blaming european knowledge systems what we need to do is that what can we do when such kind of challenges surround us when when that throbbing cultural creation is still with us surrounding us what can be done so what we need to do is that we need to reorient our teaching and research in the university in the institutional situation okay so what we are suggesting what we are talking about cultural critical humanities is that it engages with humanities unravels humanities as it has been developed by by european culture and then from within the receiving context instead of privileging the context of production the context of reception gets attention and through this context of reception we begin to ask newer kind of questions the task of the critical humanities is to pose newer kind of questions and ask the fundamental question what can be done with what is available to us so what do we do with what we have is the most challenging kind of question that critical humanities poses us because each one of us is endowed with a culture endowed with a particular cultural formation we come from a jati and we need to learn to train ourselves prepare ourselves to engage with them that is absolutely necessary across all the kinds of media you know from uh, neo cultural to digital okay so the future of humanity is depends on our participation both teacher and students participation to go beyond what europe has done or what europe has created us in the name of what is called india okay such inquiry is possible by drawing on cultural forms both of europe and india these are described this can be described in terms of vidyas in the indian context and kalas and in the european context trivium and quadrivium these are we can talk more about it but there's no time and uh, from the indian background if you begin to sketch the indian background on the basis of that we need to understand europe not understand india on the basis of what europe has created this is the task that is ahead of us and if you want to change humanities and move towards what this webinar describes as the as the new humanities new researches will have to be done by by focusing attention on the experience i'll stop here i thank you for your patience and i'll be very happy to engage with the questions thank you so much sir for your uh, thought provoking lecture thank you sir uh, Uh, may I now ask the students, participants, if you have any questions, please post it on in the uh, YouTube live chat box. Or if you have any questions, you can directly ask to our speaker. So uh, students are asking asking for the slides. If uh, if that can be possible. 
Say that again, Shakti. Is there a scope for the slides to be shared with the participants? They are asking for the slides. I will, I will do that. Once the talk is over, I'll pop okay. pass. Okay. I thought you have recorded that, haven't you? Yes, yes. Okay, but anyway, I'll, I'll pass it on. It's not a problem. Okay. I'll be very happy to take up questions. How to explore the different cultural formations? Yeah, I was, uh, Pavan, I was trying to point out that one way of doing that is by focusing on uh, the communication media. That is, that what kind of cultural forms are there? We can understand a culture on the basis of its cultural forms. What kind of cultural forms are prevalent, and then what's the communication medium that is there, and what would it? Uh, what are the ways in which this can be? Um, you know. Um, made use in order to uh, explore further, okay? There are projects that our students have done. I will ask Shakti to uh, provide you access to the website. You can take a look at them, the researches that have been done and the MA projects that have been done by various students, including Shakti himself. Uh, you will be able to take a look at them. We have developed about something something like 40 courses now in this area, and you can, you can begin to um, uh, uh, examine that, yeah. So there is another question by... I'm, I'm looking at it. In yeah. fact, the British colonies had on our soil. What is uh, uh, Saikat Sarkar? Yeah, the, what is, <clears throat> in my understanding, based on, um, of course, inquiries, the, um, we tend to think that there's no need to research or inquire into the question of caste because it's already been inframed as an oppressive system, as something that is uh, uh, that gets stigmatized. Okay, and now I think what I'm suggesting is that we need to go beyond that. We need to go beyond that and engage with that. Okay, it's a simple, simple point that nobody has been able to eradicate jati formations in the last three thousand years. Many tend to think that you know Buddhism has done that. Not at all. When you look at Buddhist work, you'll begin to see that it doesn't work. But neither Buddhism, nor Islam, nor capitalism, nor modernity, none of them has been able to eradicate that. That's why it becomes a most challenging kind of phenomena. What kind of phenomena is that? And you need to do that as a researcher, as an inquirer. What kind of tenacity is this that allows it to adapt itself, survives, doesn't consolidate into a normative category, internally constantly transforms itself? So I think it's the most challenging kind of uh, research problem that we have if you're interested in exploring that. I can talk more about that cycle, uh, but I think uh, I, there are several questions, okay? Uh, okay, so thank you, sir. Thank you so you much. Always offline contact me. We can we can talk uh, in more detail, cycle. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So we got some questions from YouTube. Uh, well, well I mean, there are several here. Uh, uh, yeah. Shikta, what do you want me to do? Yes, sir. Um, I could, uh, Shruti, that's a, an important question. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've taught a complete course. In fact, I can, if she can contact me offline, uh, I'll spend a lot more time discussing that. How did secularism take place? I'll give you one small, um, you know, statement by Derrida. He says that ours is a, a you know, barely secularized culture of, uh, barely secularized theological culture. This is the definition that Derrida gives recently, recently in sense about just before his death, this is the, this, uh, this is the uh, statement that he made. So we need to go more into um, theological formations of uh, uh, Judeo Christian traditions, and then how these theological formations manifest in conceptualization of literary categories and aesthetic categories. And this, in my argument, Kant has done, done that. Kant is a considered to be a, a major philosopher, but is a great theologian also. That's what we come across that. I can talk more about that, Shruti, uh, but uh, it requires time. Okay. Jati, I mean, there is nothing like, there is no culture without a jati, uh, Ratan. Okay. So the cultural forms that are available to you, available to us in India today, 
are largely related to specific kind of uh, jatis. Specific kind of jatis create them, generate them. Even if Ramayana has been created by so-called one particular person allegedly called Valmiki, the Ramayanas that are available to us are multiple, very different. Every region, every jati has created its own Ramayana. That is its, its kind of extraordinarily, uh, you know, kind of um, uh, distinctive kind of idiom that particular jati has created. More examples can be given. We discussed that and then we have written about that. I, I'll be able to share that with you if you contact me offline. I'll share my email with you. I'll ask uh, uh, Shakti to share my email with you. Okay. Um, yes, absolutely, Sabna. Uh, when I say cultural formation, I don't mean only, uh, you know, the caste tribe distinction is a colonial distinction. So to overcome that particular kind of distinction, we have used the word cultural formation. And the formation, the notion of formation is that something that which is always in the in in a, in a certain kind of move, as it were. It is dynamic. It is always internally transforming itself. Okay. So uh, tribes are also cultural formations. Yes, that's a slight. I mean, reasoning imagination. I can talk about, but it'll take time. Um, I'm not sure how much time do we have. Um, you know, there's no small, I mean, just a brief note. There is no, um, you know, kind of clear cut uh, hierarchy or division as it is in the case of European tradition between reasoning and imagination in the Indian Indian traditions. Okay. Shastra and Kavya are not separated. They are separated for certain kind of purposes, but every Kavi, every Kavi who practiced writing poetry or Kavya had to be uh, very well trained in Shastras. So there is a, I mean, there's an extraordinary kind of domain that uh, awaits newer researchers. We can talk more about it and I'll be happy to spend a lot of time talking about these things. Shakti. So we have another, yes, we have another question from YouTube. Uh, Sonusa asked, what is the difference between Jati and caste? What is the difference between caste and community? What is the difference, the difference between, between Jati and? Jati and caste? Okay. What is obviously, the ob obviously um, uh, historical and linguistic caste is the word that comes from uh, Portuguese casta, and uh, they use the term Portuguese use the term to uh, talk about a certain kind of hierarchy of uh, um, uh, both Christian and Judaic communities within uh, uh, Portuguese, uh, and then uh, in in, uh, uh, in Spain, and Portuguese brought that term. To India and the first thing that they saw is that they saw the dis distinctions and differences here and they imposed the term casta. Jati has a very different meaning. Jati is not simply something that refers to a group of people but Jati refers to those that can be brought together. There is Jati of trees, there is Jati of uh, animals, there is Jati of uh, you know kind of uh, mountains, Kula Parvatas we call them. Okay, so Jati refers to a certain kind of distinctiveness that enables a particular group of formations to be brought together for a particular purpose. And that is not a rigid one. That Jati is, the, 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 the source of Jati etymologically is Ja, means something that, that comes forth, that is brought forth, birthing, okay, Janani and Ja, okay. So something is brought forth forth constantly. Jati is always forming itself, reforming itself, transforming itself, okay? Whereas caste is something which is a rigid category, closed up category, and that is, uh, and also a hierarchical oppressive category, okay? That's how it is used. That gets projected onto Jati. Jati is much more dynamic. There is, there is a different kind of Jati uh, Swaras in music, different kind of Jati Vrikshas in our uh, tradition. I mean, this wonderful area, in fact, further exploration is needed. We need to know Indian languages and that is needed. It's different from community because the word community has the word unity in it, okay? And the word community first was used to talk about Christians and the only institution that can bring together a unity among the brother, a unity among the brothers is the church. Church is a church is ecclesias it's a it's a it's an institution that builds a community jati cannot be a community it will be community on the move it's a community on the 
uh, you know, kind of a change constantly. It is all the time forming and deforming itself. And historically, the jatis that existed in Manu's time are no longer available to us. New jatis have come into existence today. Okay. So there this is, is another category. Yeah. So there is another question. Was yeah. not our caste system resistant to each other? Were divisions evoked by only the European culture and thinking? Uh, can you repeat the question, Shakti? Was not our caste system resistant to each other? Were divisions evoked by only the European culture and thinking? I didn't say that. I, I, I never said that. Actually, Jati indicates the significance of difference in the country. Extraordinarily, what is important, I think if there is, a, if, if there is something seminal to Indian cultural thinking, it is the question of difference. And it grappled with the question of difference at such a depth, you won't believe it is kind of amazing at, the, at what level uh, the thinking about difference has taken place in this culture. Okay. And then when I say culture, I don't mean anything homogenous, you know, created by one particular community, dominated by another community. That's all colonial knowledge. It doesn't help us. We need to engage with this, these uh, cultural forms and then you'll begin to see that. As I've already pointed out, difference is not something introduced by Europeans. Europeans could not understand what difference is when they confronted India. Okay, They needed a certain kind of framework. And the framework is something that has come to them already from their own cultural background. There's a lovely uh, book that came out uh, from a research uh, group. It's called Western Foundations of Indian Caste System. I can give you the details later. Western Foundations of Indian Caste System. Okay, So you can begin to see that. Caste can never be a system. A system means that which is internally completely coherent and then internally more or less closed. Okay, And then there are no variations. They abide by a certain kind of principles. It is impossible to identify the principles on the basis of which uh, jatis can be uh, designated. It's impossible. Okay, What we talk about as principles, purity, purity and pollution, all these have come from uh, Christian culture. They have nothing to do with uh, Indian tradition, really. Okay. So there's another question. Uh, could you please throw some light on the idea of Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak's epistemic violence relating to psychic disjuncture? Yes, there is a relation, you can say. Um, but of course, these are two, these are from various kind of, Spivak talks about it at a rather abstract level, but of course she does talk about um, education system uh, in the Indian context in the 19th century has led to the epistemic violence, okay? But um, epistemic violence is that the, uh, I have some problems. I, I mean, I'm, I'm a great follower at one point uh, for several years of Gajra Spivak's work, but I kind of, tend to see slightly differently the whole scenario now. Um, the assumption that there is an episteme is a trouble thing, troubling thing for me. Okay, Whether you understand the word episteme from the original Greek basis or in the Foucauldian sense, um, it's, a, it's a system of thought, internally coherent, uh, developed on the basis of a particular historical context. That's a Foucauldian one. Episteme is knowledge as developed by a knowledge system developed in Greek thought, okay? So in both senses, such kind of episteme is very difficult to find in the Indian scenario. That does not mean that we don't have knowledge. Now, that's not the question here. There is something else that is involved here. So knowledge, embodied knowledge, practiced knowledge, knowledge that is lived becomes very crucial. What we call, I'm sure you know this bit of Sanskrit, anushtana practice, putting something to practice, putting your body and its endowments to practice becomes more important than simply a certain kind of theorization, yeah? projection of models. Projection of models do not become important at all. India does not create European, sorry, utopian traditions. You don't have utopian work. You don't have nostalgic work. Nostalgia and utopia are absent in Indian, Indian, Indian thought. That's very strange. There's no nostalgia. There's no, um, I mean, I can give you more examples. You know, Gata Suna, Gata Sunsha, Nanu Shochanti Pandita, you know, Gita says, okay. So there's no nostalgia and there's no utopia because what is important is that your embodied existence in a moment, in a loka, in an instant of existence becomes important. Today for us, our context is that of teachers, student, researcher. In this context, how best can you put to work your endowments is the biggest challenge. And that putting to work must be understood in the much larger kind of release of relations. 
that's very important yeah shakti uh, so there is there are so many questions certainly we cannot take all the questions one you can give uh, them my email shakti yes sir of, of course uh, there is one last question uh, indian culture got changed with the flow of the time so is there any fixed contextual meaning for the indian culture or is it a flexible context which can assimilate the other cultures ha huh. interesting question important question also but uh, um the idea or understanding of what's called culture i mean the term culture i'm unhappy with but still let me use it for the time being because we are speaking in english otherwise we would have talked about sampradayas samskaras and sampradayas that's that would have given a different meaning but anyway um the idea that culture is changing according to time is a weak notion not a very significant notion okay because there must be something that is enduring something that sustains itself in addition in spite of the historical changes that take place historical socio cultural changes that take place something endures the example that i gave you earlier is that jati endures in spite of all kinds of cataclysmic transformations that have taken place invasions multiple invasions 1000 years of islam 200 years of european culture and so called buddhism nothing has destroyed it nothing has annihilated it you cannot annihilate it okay so if that that kind of tenacity to endure is there then i think that should draw our attention why is it this is persisting why is it it is still there yeah not to create benefits for one particular community as such i mean that's a Euro, that's a colonial you know uh, 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 rant we need different ways of thinking i'm only sharing with you the absolute urgency that is that is out there to engage with these kind of traditions and cultural forms that are uh, that are part of your own background and that is needed so we need to open up and then begin to examine that thank you so much sir uh, so uh, certainly i will share the email id with you because we cannot take all the questions uh, thank you so much sir thank you for your enlightening lecture thank, thank you, you all much. thank you all for your patience and then the questions i am sorry i couldn't give you detailed answers but that would have retained me for another year on the computer here to address all your questions in detail i would be happy to do that at any point okay thank you thank you sir thank you shakti okay so now we have our second speaker next speaker so uh, dr abhishek padoi Uh, Dr. Abhishek Padoi currently teaches at IIT Madras. He has received his PhD in English Studies, uh, Department of English Studies, Durham University, under the guidance of Pro Professor Patricia Wa and John Nash. He is an associate fellow, UK Higher Education Academy. He is also a member of Memory Studies Association, an executive member of Modern Studies in Asia, and a member of editorial board. Group of the Journal of Interdisciplinary Studies in Humanities. His book titled "Postmodern Literatures: Literary Context Series" has been published from Orient Black Swan in 2018. His forthcoming book is titled "Culture and the Literary: Matter, Metaphor, Memory, Contracted with Roman and Little Things," which will publish in 2021. On behalf of the Department of English. I would like to thank you so much, sir, for joining us here today. We are eagerly waiting to listen to you. Over to you, sir. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for the very kind introduction. I will start with the uh, most quoted sentence in the post-COVID academia. Am I audible? Uh, yes, sir. Can everyone hear me? Yes. 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 Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a great honor to be uh, to be part of this uh, wonderful platform. I thank the organizers, particularly uh, Dr. Shokti Padu for inviting me. Uh, Dr. Shokti Padu obviously is a great scholar in his own right. Uh, he's also in my mind uh, uh, a very important cultural figure uh, in terms of the work he does, work he performs, and I've seen him evolve as a scholar and as a cultural figure over the years. So it's a very uh, personal, emotional experience for me as well. Uh, to be invited uh, in this platform so thank you very much so uh i will start with uh, some uh, bullet points as it were i'm not going to use the ppt 
so I'll just talk a little bit about the kind of work that I attempt to do now in memory studies. Uh, and as Shokti Bode mentioned, that we have a, a research center of for memory studies uh, under the MHRD scheme at IIT Madras. Um, we're also about to launch uh, the first Indian network for memory studies on 16th of June uh, this year. I mean, it's like next week, really, uh, through a virtual uh, uh, launch event. So I'll talk a little bit about the discipline per se, and uh, then I'll move on to uh, describe the kind of work we're doing, the kind of work we attempt to do, and hopefully that will have some resonance to uh, <clears throat> some of the uh, uh, you know, kinds of research that you're interested in, because I'm, I'm aware I'm addressing a range of researchers away uh, from literary studies, anthropology, political science, uh, etc. And uh, I'll be happy to take questions and address uh, as best I can. And most importantly, I'll be happy to learn from the interactions, because that's the whole point of coming to a session such as this. So uh, I will start with uh, a couple of um, uh, sort of trivial examples. Uh, and then I'll move on to something uh, more anecdotal, and then I'll connect that to uh, the center research, the central research question, uh, one of the central research questions in memory studies. Uh, the two flippant examples that I'll use are from Slavoj Zizek, uh, and I'm hoping it's so familiar to most of you, and then I'll move on to an anecdotal example. So Zizek's uh, you know, very funny stories, it's full of funny stories. I'm just gonna pick two. Uh, to sort of make a point, and then I'll move on to connect that to uh, the research topic that I have in mind. So the first story, again, I'm hoping is familiar to most of you. And this is from the book, uh, I think, Welcome to the Desert of the Rio, where he talks about that, you know, Eastern German uh, condition of, you know, someone being sent to a hard labor camp when suspected of doing any anti-state activity, right? So a person gets arrested and is supposed to be sent off to a hard labor camp, uh, prior to his departure, he makes a, a pact with his friend. He tells him that he's going to be in a concentration camp, so obviously every move of his will be monitored. Uh, he'll be under very strong and strict surveillance. Uh, so he will write letters to his friends, but he needs to establish a court uh, before that. So he tells his friend that if I write a letter to you in blue ink, uh, assume that everything I'm writing in that letter is true, is, is fine, is all valid. Uh, is all correct. However, if I'm writing a letter to you in red ink, just invert the logic uh, and just assume whatever I'm saying is just the opposite. So, for instance, if I'm telling you in blue ink that I'm fine, it means I'm actually fine. But if I'm telling that to you, if I'm writing that to you in red ink, uh, just assume that I am in great distress, perhaps in danger. So he makes that back and it goes off to the uh, uh, labor camp. Uh, a month later, his friends receive a letter from him uh, written in blue ink, uh, which goes like, uh, you know, I'm very fine here. It's actually not a bad place at all. Uh, we are allowed to have rest hours. We are allowed to play football. We are allowed to watch television, cinema. Uh, the weekends were off. So I don't quite know what is the bad thing about uh, labor camp, the way it is projected. Uh, we have everything we need to live a decent life, except one thing. We don't have red ink. And that obviously points to the question of agency. And Zizek articulates that in a very interesting way. He says, uh, you know, he has everything except that one thing uh, through which he can articulate his non-freedom. That's the only missing thing. The missing red ink away uh, uh, becomes a metaphor. Now, I'll connect that to another story by Zizek, which is more flippant and more consumerist, you know, typical Western consumer story, uh, which is about a man walking into a very expensive uh, cafeteria uh, and ordering, uh, looking, looking at a menu card uh, and ordering uh, coffee without cream, which is what is written uh, in, in a menu card, coffee without cream. Uh, he orders that coffee without cream, and a minute later, the waiter comes back to him and tells him, I'm sorry, sir, we cannot serve you coffee without cream because we have run out of cream. Uh, would you like to have black coffee instead? Uh, Again, what's interesting in the seemingly trivial story by Zizek is how absence plays a very important role. So in order to give you coffee without cream in that consumerist uh, definition, you need to have cream in the kitchen to give you coffee without cream. So absence plays a very interesting role over here in a very hyper-consumerist uh, presence. Now, both stories, one more political and one more consumerist, uh, you know, they, they sort of 
try to convey uh, essentially one very key thing is the production of absence and how absence becomes a very key category uh, in our reading of cultural activities, uh, in our reading of uh, political activities, political narratives, cultural narratives. Now, I'm just going to use it as a starting point and move on to uh, the kind of work we do in memory studies, which is a lot to do with absences, you know, the kind of things which are missing uh, in memory, collective memory, personal memory, narratives of memory. Uh, in memory studies, we we have this very interesting engagement with absence, and that's something that I'll come, keep coming back to in this session as well. The engagement with absence, engagement with things which are not said, uh, things which are not discussed, things which are not articulated. And our memory studies becomes an interesting medium through which this kind of representation of absence, this calibration of absence, shall we say, is articulated uh, in very, very complex ways. Uh, which brings me to uh, a, a personal story, uh, and which is interesting as well. And I'm, I'm guessing some of you who have uh, attended similar sessions where I've spoken about this uh, will know this. It's probably is a reputation, but I'll still say it for the sake of, uh, you know, making a point. And this is an experience I had when I was in Britain doing my PhD, when I was watching a film with a friend of mine, white British person, you know, otherwise very liberal, very open-minded, very critical of imperialism, I should say. Uh, we were watching a film, uh, and then there was a scene in the film uh, which showed the Jallianwala Bark massacre, the, the brutal event during uh, imperial history where thousands of people, innocent civilians, were killed uh, brutally uh, by a direct order from the British police. And uh, we were watching that scene, and uh, he, this person that I was watching with, with, he got very, very uneasy. He got up and he asked me, well, if this really had happened in, in imperial history. Uh, I was taken by surprise, obviously, because here we have a very well-read, well-traveled, open-minded, liberal, white British person who was asking me if Jalil Wallabad had taken place. Well, I asked him, it, I, I told him it did take place. I Googled up, I showed him images which disturbed him even further. Then I asked him, how come he doesn't know that this even had taken place? And his answer was very uh, quick and very, very submissive. He said he doesn't know this even because it is never taught uh, in British history. It's never taught in history books. Now, that particular moment was one of those light bulb moments you have in your research when you begin to have this epiphany and say okay maybe this is one direction that the research can take uh, which is to say that things which are not said you know knowledge narratives and narratives of knowledge which are not articulated which are hidden which are sort of submerged uh, which are pushed into the long grass to use a metaphor uh, which obviously brings us to the whole complexity of knowledge formation uh, which informs memory because if you look at memory studies as a, uh, as a study of remembering and i can use the word remembery with a hyphen maybe in between re slash memory what what it also entails in a certain sense is that something must have happened something must have you know be absent something must have been dismembered uh, something must have been removed from the present uh, it's a departure from the present through which the process of remembering takes place now what we also know uh, through empirical evidence today, uh, through neuroscientific research today, uh, is how uh, remembering, or remembering, shall we say, uh, also entails, uh, you know, imagination, also entails forgetting, also entails absences. In other words, if you have to remember something, uh, you must be able to forget certain things. Right? And uh, notice how I'm using the word forgetting as an ability, something that you must be able to do. Right? Forgetting as an ability, forgetting not as something which passively happens to you, uh, forgetting as something which you should do, uh, which you are supposed to do, uh, at a very neural level, at a very psychological level. In other words, the human brain is hardwired to remember and forget simultaneously. Uh, the human brain is hardwired, uh, nearly hardwired, to remember and unremember uh, simultaneously. Right? In, in other words, you have to unremember in order to remember. So that is uh, a connected category. So we're looking at forgetting and remembering uh, not as ontological opposites per se, but as connected categories, as ontologically connected categories, as cognitively uh, connected categories. They happen almost simultaneously. And there are very interesting uh, case studies in, in medical research, as well as in literature, uh, for the matter, uh, of you know people who are not able to forget and how that affects uh, the other you know attributes, how that affects the other cognitive attributes. Uh, so Borges, for instance, have, I mean, the Spanish writer Borges uh, has a fascinating story called Funes the Memorius. It's about a boy called Funes, 
um, and who has, you know, who if he suffers a, a, a tragedy, he falls from a horse, gets hit on the head, uh, it's a blunt force trauma, and the disease he develops is that he uh, he's not able to forget anymore. In other words, he loses the ability to forget. So again, notice how Borges is depicting this as an ability. He is not able to forget anything anymore. He literally remembers everything, every single detail, uh, every data, every information, every number, every image, etc. Now, what that does at a very cognitive level, at a, at a very experiential level, is that it begins to affect his other attributes, his, his ability to for abstractions, his ability to empathize, his ability to connect himself imaginatively. And all these attributes begin to get impaired uh, because he's not able to forget anymore. Right? So again, we're looking at forgetting as a very interesting ability through which the human mind uh, operates. It, it must happen uh, for the human mind to operate in a normal, normative uh, fashion. Uh, and there are several case studies uh, in medicine and medical research as well, uh, some which cite the Borges story uh, as a very interesting example in fiction, almost a Kafkaesque example in fiction, someone who doesn't forget. Now, this is obviously the micro-psychological quality of memory, uh, with, with which we know through different uh, uh, researchers today. I mean, some of the biggest names in the field uh, are Eric Kandel, E R I C, Eric K A N D E L, Eric Kandel, uh, Joseph Ledoux, uh, L E D O U X, uh, and you know, obviously a very, very important figure as Antonio Damasio. Uh, and I'll come to each of these figures uh, in more details later in terms of how that connects to our understanding of collective memory, literary memory, public memory, etc. Right, because the whole point of memory studies uh, is looking at the interface between the uh, micro neural activity of remembering and forgetting and the more macro extended uh, collective quality of remembering and forgetting and how we can have some interesting overlaps uh, in terms of how memory operates as a psychological category but also as a cultural category also as a as a collective category shall we say All right so if you, if you come to someone like uh, uh, Damasio, for instance, uh, Damasio's most important work, uh, and I'm sure many of you read Damasio's work, uh, interestingly writes in philosophers like Spinoza, like Descartes, etc. But his most interesting work is to look at the relationship between uh, uh, emotion and cognition, right? So he talks about the emotional self, the whole idea of, uh, you know, how the ability to be emotional uh, it is something which directly informs cognition, directly shapes cognition. In other words, if you're not able to emote, if you're not able to empathize, your ability to cognize also begins to get um, impaired. And that's something which we see in several instances of trauma victims, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder victims, where people suffer uh, this ability, uh, inability to emote anymore, and that impairs their cognitive abilities as well. Right, so emotion and cognition become very connected categories, and obviously Damasio talks about the zones in the human brain, while the emotional center and the memory center, hippocampus, are very closely connected. So, you know, impairing one impairs the other by default. Uh, in other words, it is safe to uh, define the human brain as an affective machine, something which produces and consumes effect. And that is how we have evolved as animals, we have evolved as primates, uh, higher primates, shall we say. Uh, you know, through culture, through storytelling, through art, uh, through religion, through science, through different kinds of narratives, right? So the ability to emote, right? And all these narratives that I just mentioned are very highly affective narratives. They draw an effect, they produce effect, they share effect, they consume effect, right? So. One of the key strands in memory studies today is uh, looking at uh, engaging with effect theory, you know, and uh, the whole idea of culture. And I was uh, listening to Professor Venkat Rao, a fascinating session before, uh, in terms of looking at culture uh, as something which, uh, you know, keeps reconsolidating. You know, that's very, very interesting. And that's directly related to the kind of work we are trying to do in memory studies. Our culture as a process of reformation, right? Reconsolidation. How is it that certain narratives, uh, you know, keep, you know, reproducing, uh, keep getting reproduced, keep getting consumed all, all the time across the ages? It's, it's something must be uh, something about the tenacity, as Professor Raoul would say, uh, and also about the plasticity. You know, it keeps reproducing itself in very plastic ways. Uh, it keeps connecting different kinds of contexts, different kinds of conditions. Uh, the material conditions change, the technological conditions change, uh, the scientific conditions change, but you know, different strands of culture uh, keep reproducing themselves through very effective as well as material ways. And the 
the affective vector of culture is something which I think uh, we should pay a lot of attention to as, as students of culture studies, as students of uh, you know, memory studies, etc. And this is where literature comes in as a very key medium, shall we say, because literature may be defined very safely uh, as an affective representation of culture. It is supposed to move us. It's a moving medium. It's a moving representation of culture. Uh, it, ha it has a lot of mobility to it. The whole idea of plot, character, action, climax, anticlimax, uh, you know, suspension uh, of disbelief, or whatever term that you may use, they all rely on kinesis. They all rely on mobility. You know, the story must move, uh, you know, and it also must move us. And so looking at movement uh, in a very complex way. Uh, the story, the plot is progressing. There's movement at that level, at that dimension, but it's also equally a movement at the reader league uh, dimension that we are moved as readers when we read a, you know, a great book of literature, whether it's an epic or a novel, you know, any of these uh, you know, categories of theater or poetry, any category that you can think of, right? So, and this is where literature becomes very, very interesting uh, in memory studies today. Literature becomes very interesting, not just in memory, but also in cognitive studies. And we have this entire uh, genre of novel called neuro novel, right? The novel about cognition, the novel about you know neural mechanisms, the novel about how we cognize and recognize reality, etc. So we can think of uh, any number of examples in that tradition. Uh, and, uh, and memory, forgetting, identity. I mean, these have been uh, parts of literary discourse since the beginning of time, so since the inception uh, of uh, literary writing. Uh, we can think of, you know, in our Indian tradition, I mean, all the great epics that we have, and also great works of literature, uh, Abhikana Shakuntalam, for instance. I mean, the, the role of forgetting is such a key thing there, right? So the king forgets the promise, and then, you know, there's a certain material which reminds the king uh, of the promise. You know, it's, it's so much about memory and forgetting and how identities are produced, deproduced and reproduced through acts of remembering and forgetting, which happens sometimes simultaneously, sometimes differently, but sometimes through very material markers. So, you know, Kalidas's uh, work, that, that phenomenal work, Abhikana Shakuntalam, is a really uh, complex example of how memory forgetting operates uh, through materials and emotions and effect. Right now, I don't, you can think of an example, uh, you know, closer, you know, to our times as well. I mean, partition literature is a very good case in point. Some of uh, Manto's stories are excellent examples uh, of how memory forgetting storytelling and the ability to narrativize uh, emotions, the ability to give a narrative shape to emotions, uh, and sometimes the lack of that ability, uh, how that informs uh, you know, our, uh, our sense of belonging to the world, and also our corporeal situation. You know, we as bodies, we as feeling bodies, we as citizens, we are subjects, and how uh, does the ability to story tell our life, story tell our situation, and the, the lack of the ability, you know, at the same time, how that affects our emotions, how it affects our memories. So, in a nutshell, we're looking at literature, uh, in particularly in memory studies, as a very effective medium uh, through which there's various vectors of remembering, forgetting, re-remembering, and, uh, and uh, you know, these play out uh, in very complex combinations. Uh, and if you define literature uh, as a combination of different kinds of lenses, so you know, for instance, if you read a novel, uh, it obviously draws on or on a certain cultural condition. It draws on a certain historical condition. I mean, no novel is written in vacuum, right? So every novel emerges from a certain cultural condition, a certain social condition. It, it reflects it as well as departs from it in, in, in very complex ways. Now, what that means is the literary uh, tradition or the literary medium uh, is a combination of reality and possibility, right? So it is what really happens, and it can also be about what may happen, what may not happen, what could have happened, what should have happened. So all these different perspectives come together and makes literature a very potent medium. We talk about possibilities of remembering and forgetting things which are not said, uh, things which are you know you know buried, things which are you know resurrected, things which are brought back again. But and uh, how the various processes, the various uh, modalities of memory and forgetting, they inform identity formation. They inform identity reformation in, in various ways. Right. So we, we can look at identity as a constant process of becoming, unbecoming. But you know, there is also the, the, the tenacity. I really like that word that Professor Rao mentioned. There's also this tenacity about identity. This is sort of plasticity, the elastic quality about identities, which make them sort of recursive categories. A certain cultural narratives, certain cultural tropes, a certain cultural forms, uh, you know, they operate in a very recursive fashion. And that recursivity becomes a very interesting 
part of how we uh, operate, how we negotiate with culture, how we negotiate with knowledge per se. Right now, there's a very interesting uh, relationship one may have between recursivity and remembering. Right, in terms of what you remember, what we choose to remember, what we choose to unremember. And you know, sometimes these processes are very deliberate processes, sometimes these processes are very political processes, whereas uh, whereby certain moments of history, certain events in history are deliberately erased uh, from textbooks, from public memory, from collective imagination, etc. There are many examples you can think of. Uh, one immediate example that comes to mind uh, in Milan Kundera's work, uh, you know, about uh, Eastern Europe, you know, that zone called Eastern Europe about communism and post-communism and how the uh, a book like the book of laughter and forgetting is entirely about that isn't it about how identities architecture bodies uh, narratives are remembered unremembered you know and then forgotten as well as resurrected and how does complex play of remembering resurrection forgetting uh, oblivion amnesia they operate at private individual levels as well as collective shared levels right and that, that interplay is interesting over here as well right and Kundera's work obviously is just one example we can think of many examples uh, from our tradition from you know, different traditions across the world uh, so for instance this one poem that i teach very very regularly in my memory course and that's a poem called iraqi nights by Dunaya mikhail it's a really wonderful poem and i recommend that i read it uh, it's about using ancient mesopotamian myths to talk about uh, the current condition of Iraq. And obviously the current condition is a Middle Eastern global conflicts, the violence of you know lack of political order, absences, etc. Right? And how uh, the mythic method used by Mikhail in that poem, and I recommend it very heavily. Do look it up. It's called Iraqi Nights by Junea Mikhail. Uh, M-I-K-H-A-I-L, right? So that poem is a very good example of how the literary medium, the lyrical medium in this particular case, becomes almost um, a very complex commentary on remembrance and uh, forgetting, and a very so connected categories as entangled categories. Now, let's just come back a little bit again to uh, some of the scientific work done uh, on memory studies today. So I mentioned someone called Joseph Ledoux, now, Ledoux has a very interesting uh, book called uh, Anxious. It's just called Anxious. It talks about the modern state, uh, how we consume information, how we consume knowledge systems, how, you know, the whole idea of this constant consumption of information and, uh, you know, knowledge systems around us, whether we want it or not, uh, makes anxiety a very normative category. We're always already anxious. Uh, we just become anxious animals. Now, in that particular book called Anxious, uh, Ledoux makes a very interesting uh, point uh, he offers a very uh, interesting theory uh, in terms of memory. Uh, and he says that, you know, when we remember something, and it's called reconsolidation theory, that's the theory that he says, reconsolidation theory, where he makes the point that when we remember something, uh, we don't actually remember the original memory of it or the original event of it. We remember the last remembered version of it. So we can immediately say that we see uh, how there's a certain textual quality about memory as uh, something which is always slipping away, uh, almost deridden in, in quality, something so sort of almost differing and differing uh, from the original even. Now, what that means uh, in a very clear scientific way, is that you is uh, making the point over there. There are others who say the same thing, I'll come to those in a moment. Where he's saying that you know the last remembered version is obviously some kind of a code, some kind of a consolidation that happened in the brain. You choose to remember it that way, and you're drawing on that template to remember that again, and that's uh, the constant process of uh, departure and death row that uh, takes place through that model. Now, what that also means that you know if you look at memory, I mean scientifically speaking, memory operates through three fundamental phases. One is encoding, the second is consolidation, and the third is retrieval. Encoding, consolidation, and retrieval. So first you encode information, you encode experiences, and there's a term for it called engrams as well. Uh, there's the cognitive schema that Bartlett talks about earlier as well. But anyway, the whole process of encoding experiences, encoding events through certain neural mechanisms, and then you consolidate that. And this is where the difference between long-term memory and short-term memory happens, right? So some memories become long-term, some memories stay short-term. But then again, this is all very mutable, and the short-term memories can become long-term and vice versa. And there are examples of, let's say, something like retrograde amnesia, which does that, but I'm not going to get too technical about that. And that last bit, 
is retrieval. So encoding, consolidation, retrieval. So retrieval is the process in which you retrieve what you had encoded and consolidated. Now, notice how all these three stages, uh, they have a certain kind of slipperiness to it. See, when you encode information, obviously, the process of encoding is like a bit like representation. Every act of representation includes inclusion as well as exclusion. We, we know that in literary studies, we know that in cultural studies, any act of representation will also exclude certain bits. Right? So exclusion also becomes part of it. It's a key factor. It's a key component. It's a fundamental feature of almost all acts of representation. So we have excluded voices. We have excluded entities. So exclusion plays a very important role. And this connects uh, to the point that I began with, absences, you know, how we need to look at absences or engage with absence. So memory series often becomes an engagement with absence in a certain way. So, uh, you know, encoding becomes the process through which inclusion and exclusion operate simultaneously, right? And consolidation, again, certain bits are left out, certain bits are consolidated, and then retrieval, again, has exclusion embedded in it as a very key category. So the point is, uh, whether we look at it as a textual model, whether we look at it as a reconstructed model, whether we look at it as a reconsolidation model, uh, exclusion plays a very important role uh, in memory studies. And, you know, and if you take that model, uh, which is scientific, neuroscientific, psychological, and map it onto, say, let's say something like cultural studies, uh, something like cultural memory or collective memory. Uh, even there, we find that certain versions of memory become dominant versions, and certain versions become less dominant versions. Right, and that interplay, you know, informs culture in terms of how cultures get consolidated through recursive patterns. And again, patterns play a very important role in cultures. Right, certain patterns become recursive, uh, certain patterns become, you know, less recursive, and then, you know, latent. So there's a dominant discourse in culture, there's a latent discourse in culture. So in certain cultural processes operate through this interplay of dominance, recursive and latency, shall we say. Now, uh, Ledoux also has this uh, very interesting uh, book that I recommend again to all of you. It's called The Synaptic Self. And again, I'm hoping some of you may have read it, uh, The Synaptic Self, and it's got another book called The Emotional Brain. So again, notice how a very hardcore neuroscientists like Ledoux and Eric Kandel and Antonio Damasio, they're using uh, metaphors from philosophy. You know, they're talking about the self, they're talking about emotions, they're talking about, you know, how, you know, the whole idea of subjectivity happens. And these are terms which are normally, uh, you know, used by philosophers. But what gets uh, amply evident in the process is this increasing interest in neuroscience, increasing interest in psychology, in things which were, you know, hitherto used by philosophers and literary people, etc. Right. So that that becomes that convergence begins to become quite clear. Now, in that book that I just mentioned, the synaptic self by Joseph Ledoux, uh, the interesting theory that he mentions uh, in that work is that. The process of cognition, the process of recognition, the process of knowledge transmission, of you know the way we encode events in our head, in our brain, uh, takes place through synapses. What are synapses? Synapses are the spaces between the neurons, so between one neuron and the other neuron. So that is where the electrochemical transmission takes place. So that space between the neuron is called a synapse. And according to the new theory, the synapse or the in-betweenness of neurons is where the negotiation with knowledge, information, encoding experiences take place. Now, this begins to sound very postmodern in a very classic way, right? that interstitial quality about cognition, that interface quality about cognition. But what it also reminds us again is that how, uh, you know, the, the whole idea of encoding experiences, the whole idea of making something into a narrative, making something into a shape, uh, is a complex process of uh, in engagement with absences and uh, presences, a complex process of engaging with what gets included and what gets excluded, even the very hardcore neural level that is operated. And that is what makes the mind so uh, complex in quality. That's what makes the mind so uh, phenomenal in quality. And that's why uh, scientists today are more interested in the mind rather than the brain, right? because the mind emerges as more complex, uh, as more uh, you know, phenomenal, as more uh, ambivalent. And this is another very, very key category, ambivalence. And just before I came to the session, I was speaking in another session uh, somewhere else, where I was talking about ambivalence and how in a very paradoxical way, the, the very quick and immediate difference between the robot and the human mind is the latter's, the human mind's ability to be ambivalent. And again, I'm using ambivalence as an ability, right? And, and I'm using the word ambivalence as, in a very epistemological sense, ambivalence. Uh, ambi being both as an ambidextrous, 
balance those values, the board values. So board values are simultaneously present, simultaneously possible, simultaneously uh, accommodated and articulated, right? And this ability to be uncertain, this ability to be sort of accommodating both balances together is what makes the human brain unique compared to the robot brain or the AI uh, machine, right? And we also know, I mean, there's a lot of work done on AI, uh, a lot of work done on, you know, artificial uh, simulation, XR, uh, you know, mixed reality, extended reality, etc. Uh, and we, in IT McGrath, we also work uh, quite consistently with some of the people in TCS, for instance, is a lab uh, in, uh, uh, called Exile lab in TCS, and we uh, collaborate with them quite often in Chennai. And, you know, they, they look at cognition from a different perspective, how, you know, the augmented reality gives you a very different version of cognition, etc. But, the interesting thing is, the human mind is far more complex than that. We, we all know it. Uh, the human mind, the way it consumes knowledge, the way it negotiates with knowledge, the way it you know becomes a cultural animal, as we all are, is a very complex process of encoding. Right? And culture is a process of, uh, you know, there's, there's a contagious quality about culture. It sort of spreads. There's an effect quality about culture, it, it must have some kind of a stickiness to it. It must stick. Certain values, certain principles, certain patterns must stick across time, must sort of pass on intergenerationally. So there is that you know, phenomenal, abstract, uh, effective quality of culture, which is also materially shaped, which is also materially informed, right? And we all know today that the human brain just takes uh, 20 watts. Uh, of electric power to do that, which is absurd. I mean, given how much money and how much uh, power needs to be pumped into AI to even come close to that. So human brain can just do that, far more complex things, with just 20 watt of energy, right? And that's all it takes to, you know, make us who we are as ambivalent cultural animals who can produce, reproduce knowledge, remember, unremember, learn, unlearn, etc. Now, just to begin to wind up, uh, so what does memory studies look at? So what is the role of memory studies today? And what kind of shape uh, should memory studies take uh, in a research like this, especially in an Indian setting uh, where we are working? So, you know, this whole idea, the whole uh, engagement with absence, uh, looking at machine learning, looking at culture, looking at human brain, looking at text, looking at literature, it's all connected categories because, you know, the whole idea of culture as an ecosystem, as an entanglement of the organic and the inorganic, the active and the passive, uh, the man and the machines so come together. So we are looking at culture as a very entangled, uh, you know, organic slash inorganic activity through which certain recursive patterns get consolidated, uh, certain recursive patterns get, you know, produce in certain uh, other forms. So memory studies in our mind uh, should be interested, uh, should aim at this very interesting blend between affectivity and discursivity, right? Because, you know, this is also part of the discursive formation, how identities are formed, reformed, deformed, uh, reproduced, deproduced. These are obviously have a lot of ideological discursive investments. But how does discursivity and the affectivity they become connected categories because for every discourse to become operative, to be operational, to be dominant in any certain way, there must be a lot of affective investment, right? There must be a lot of affect, uh, you know, invested to it, uh, emotions, affect, and that must also be collective in quality, shared in quality. So we're not just looking at the Fed as a private category, we're also looking at the Fed as a shared collective category, something which must be consumed and spread and reproduced with different kinds of vectors. And obviously, you know, we can do any vector, the textbook, the printing press, the digital media, uh, everything. So just as a way of conclusion, one other interesting um, uh, theoretical framework that we find extremely helpful uh, in memory studies is material engagement theory, or MET. Uh, and Londres Malafurius has a wonderful book called How Things Shape the Mind, right, which is about the whole idea of material cognition. So how, you know, we are always already enmeshed by materials, surrounded by materials. So on the one hand, uh, the human brain imagines and shapes and scientifically gives, uh, you know, shape to materials. But on the other hand, the human mind is also shaped by materials. So there's a bi-directional quality uh, through which we engage and negotiate with knowledge, negotiate with culture, right? So materiality, affectivity, discursivity, all this become very, very connected categories. And that's something which we know through neuroscience, something which we know through psychology, but most importantly, something which literature can remind us in a very interesting way. And we can go back to the earliest forms of literature you know, the way machines operate, you know, Renaissance, the early epics, anything, we find that there's always this engagement with materials that humans have had, through which identities have been produced, deproduced, and reproduced. So machines have always been a part of the human imagination. So 
at a certain level, memory is a very, very ancient thing. I mean, memory has always been there since the birth of time, since the birth of the primate that we are, and how that has evolved through different kinds of time. And also the discipline is quite new, because that's something which we are systematically looking at, maybe for the last 20 years or so, right? But just as a way of conclusion, the other thing that I just want to highlight uh, as kind of work we do in memory studies today in IIT Madras is we want to move away from the big event model of memory studies. So a large part of memory studies is about trauma, is about the Holocaust, is about the big event model. Something big must happen, something huge must happen. Uh, and then, you know, we are remembering that through different ways, etc. So there is that a lot of work on, you know, trauma studies, Holocaust studies, partition studies, etc. But, I mean, keeping that as the way it is, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of scholarship which is done and, you know, should be done. And there are new ways of looking at those things as well. But we're also looking at the dailiness of remembering and forgetting, the very Cotodian quality of remembering and forgetting, something which happens on an everyday basis, through our everyday engagement with materials, through our everyday engagement with you know codes, which become which make us cultural animals, right? Culture as an activity is an everyday process. It doesn't rely on big event. It relies on the negotiation with everydayness, the negotiation with the Cotodian quality, what we are and who we are. So just as a final uh, point, I would like to say that memory studies uh, the way we're looking at today, we should also look at the slow memory model, uh, right, rather than the big event model. I mean, there is that there. I mean, the big event, the catastrophe, a political disaster, uh, you, know, um, you know, big event, the trauma, etc. I mean, that obviously will generate memory in a very immediate way. But also, let's take a look at the ecology of remembering, the slow moving uh, model of memory through which we remember our everydayness. And let's, let's engage with that. Let's engage with the everydayness of remembering and forgetting, just like we engage with absence as a very vital form of remembering and the absence and the lack of it. Right? So I'll just end at this point and I'm happy to take some questions if there are any. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, sir, for your enlightening lecture. This was wonderful. Uh, may I ask the audience to ask questions if you have any? And also the audience who are watching the YouTube, they can also post their questions in the live YouTube chat box. Please uh, ask your questions. We'll put across your question to sir. I'm, I'm happy to engage with questions that people are to email me as well. So if there's a lengthier question that, you know, people want references to the works that I mentioned, I'm happy to get back to them as well. So feel free to email me as well, please. So there is one question uh, asked by Sresto Chakraborty. Is synesthesia an advantage for memory studies? That's a very good question. I mean, synesthesia is a, obviously a very complex cognitive condition where you have different kinds of sense perceptions uh, accidentally, but sometimes uh, medically and medical condition overlapping with each other. Now, that obviously has a definite uh, perspective on memory studies because that gives you a sense of reality from, you know, a simultaneous perspective. We, we touch in here and smell at the same time. So uh, some interesting work is done in Synesthesia and also and this is where literature also comes in in a very interesting way because literature can be synesthetic in quality. So if you read uh, a moving lyric, for example, right? So the way the language is produced in a lyric can be synesthetic in quality. So yeah, my answer would be a very strong yes. It's a very key and very vital component and it can have a very uh, privileged perspective in terms of how we recognize reality with an overlapping of emotions and sensations. Thank you. Okay, uh, there's another question. Uh, can memory be trusted in the case of autobiographical writings where the selective use of memory comes into play and is there issues of mimetic theory associated with it? Yes, it's a very good question. So the whole idea of unreliability has always been embedded in memory, right? and I talked about this in some details. And it's a very strong uh, uh, 
tradition and fiction as well. I mean, we can talk about postmodern unreliable fiction. So the whole idea of the unreliable storyteller, uh, you know, becomes uh, uh, interesting because, uh, as we know through uh, uh, neuroscientific evidence today, through scientific evidence today, that you know the whole idea of reliable memory, a total recall, uh, is is a myth. It doesn't exist. So every memory has unreliability embedded in it. Now, having said that, uh, what I should also uh, caution a little bit is that we, we're not looking at uh, unreliability as the opposite of objective memory, as the opposite of documented memory. So we're not saying, well, just because every memory is unreliable, let's do away with historical memory, let's do away with unreliable documented memory. It's not that simple. That will, again, put us back in the same trap of dualism. So we're looking at unreliability as something which is always already there in any act of remembering, right? So with that in mind, we will still continue to document history, we'll still continue to document memory as best we can. So subjectivity and objectivity are not ontological opposites of each other. So just because all memory is subjective, it doesn't mean we should not aspire for any objective history. We should not aspire for every objective uh, documentation. We should just say, oh, let's do away with all kinds of history. That's anarchic and that's irresponsible research, I think. So I think the whole idea of subjectivity and unreliability should be careful fully calibrated with in any engagement with documentary history and objective reality. Yeah, thank you for your question. Yeah. Uh, so another question by Omkita Boshra. Uh, can memory study be applied on personal grief and its documentation uh, in literature? Uh, personal guilt, is that right? Personal grief. Grief, grief. Okay. Yeah. That's, a very good That's a very good question. May I know who asked the question? Uh, Ankita Boshak. Thank you, Ankita. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to engage with you later over email as well, because grief and mourning are very key categories in memory, right? The whole idea of uh, mourning. And, you know, th this is very interesting because we have this very interesting work on especially traumatic memory where mourning becomes an impediment to memory. So when you're still mourning, you, you choose not to remember in a certain sense, right? So mourning and memory become almost sort of conflicting categories in a certain sense. I'm sure you're aware of this research. Now, one particular person that I should mention uh, is someone called Pierre Jeanette, uh, J-A-N-E-T. Now, Jeanette was a contemporary of Freud. I mean, he didn't become as famous as Freud did. But his work is interesting because he was the first... Uh, psychologist, if you could call him a psychologist back in those days, who used the term traumatic memory. Now, he used the word traumatic memory in connection and with, with a departure from something he called narrative memory. Right? So narrative memory and traumatic memory are different attributes. Now, his theory was this, which is in response to your question as well, that when the memory is purely traumatic in quality, it will not become narrative. So for a traumatic memory to become narrative memory, there must be a process of mourning through which the mind must negotiate with the disaster, negotiate with the tragedy, and then be in a position to narrate. Now, this is something which we find a lot in trauma studies, when people choose not to remember, when people choose not to narrate. Uh, we have, you know, examples of abuse victims, violence victims, uh, people who suffer trauma, uh, you know, tragedy, you know, bodily harm, etc. When they choose not to tell the story, they choose not to uh, get or attend any interviews, right? And that is, again, a resistance to narrative memory, right, in a certain sense, because the, narrative, the memory is purely traumatic in quality. So mourning and memory become very complex categories. And in a certain sense, mourning becomes an impediment to memory. You know, you, you stop yourself from remembering because it's still mourning. So mourning becomes a very key process, uh, which is complexly connected as well as disconnected uh, to memory. But I would recommend you read up Pierre Jeanette's work uh, on trauma traumatic memory and narrative memory for a fuller response to your excellent question. Thank you. Uh, sir, uh, Professor Joita Sungupta wants to ask a question. Ma'am, please. Hello? Ma'am, are you there? Hello. Thank you, Abhishek. Yeah, I'm back. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, Can you hear me? Yeah. Thanks, Abhishek. Uh, it was a wonderful lecture. I wasn't there for the first part, but I listened to the second half. It was very engaging. Uh, I've been listening to all your lectures on YouTube, but I think this one was really very engaging compared to the other lectures which I have been listening to. I have two questions, actually, uh, you know, not just to this lecture, but to all the lectures that I've been listening. One is about the regressive memory. So I actually have Brian Weiss in uh, mind, you know, what would you have to say about regressive memory? Because that pertains to parapsychology. Um, 
and uh, how that connects with the spiritual memory as well as the atavistic memory. That's one question. And uh, the second question is like in all the narratives that we have in sky fi or maybe, you know, narratives also you have that in Harry Potter where you have the time which could be uh, shifted back to the past as well as to the present, fast forward. And then you have a time in between, which is no time at all. So that is also a part of memory. So in which category of memory would you really, uh, you know, uh, say that these narratives belong to? So that's my question. Thank you, Professor Andres. So good to see you after uh, ages. Uh, These are excellent questions. Uh, so the first, I'll take the first one first. So the whole idea of uh, uh, repressive memory and how that manifests itself in, you know, alternate conditions, alternate realities. So again, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, I'm not an expert in parapsychology, but I think the work that Ledoux mentions uh, on anxiety, right, that becomes interesting because he talks about the anxious self and how the anxious self uh, constantly consumes and produces uh, different kinds of realities, which are lived realities as well as imagined realities. So that idea of the reconsolidation model that Ledoux talks about in that particular book, I think is very interesting. But he's saying that, you know, when you remember something, remember the last remembered version, which is obviously meaning that there's a lot of emotional and affective investment uh, in memory. And that affective investment is oriented by the subject's situatedness in that particular space time, which is also to say there's also the possibility uh, of an alternate model of memory, an alternate experience of reality uh, through a memory which may or may not be real. And again, that, that possibility is always there. Because if you're remembering the last remembered version uh, of uh, the memory, which is obviously meaning that the original memory, whatever that was, it has been departed from significantly. What it also means is there's also the possibility of producing alternative memories, which may or may not be real. And the good thing about Ledoux is he's not making a judgment on, you know, saying that there's a hierarchy between real memory and unreal memory. I and mean, that hierarchy is completely absent. And mind you, this is a hardcore neuroscientist who is writing about this. So this is very, very key, I think. So I think my, my response would be, uh, for want of a better expert advice, because I'm not read in parapsychology, but my response would be in that direction, that neuroscience is actually trying to dabble with the, the idea of alternative memories, which may or may not be right. Now, uh, the second question uh, about, uh, you know, the idea of uh, time, timelessness and memory. So two philosophers come to mind immediately. One is uh, Mikhail Bakhtin uh, and his idea of the chronotop, right? the idea of space-time compound, where, you know, space is always already temporal and time is always already spatial in quality, right? So that idea of space-time together uh, as a literary device, and Bakhtin was actually phenomenal uh, in the way he theorized it. And we draw a lot on Bakhtin in, in memory studies. And we take the idea of chronotop from a literary category to a more social category as well. I mean, especially in a time like this. Uh, so, for instance, I have a paper coming up uh, in Memory Studies Journal, but I talk about the COVID-19 chronotop, right? Because how the COVID-19 can be seen as a chronotop, a special, special kind of space-time, uh, which is entirely defamiliarized, which has completely decentralized our idea of time, our idea of space, right? So it's a de-specialization, de together. So Bakhtin's chronotop is a very key uh, uh, point that you know be useful in response to your question. And the point about timelessness, the time point about spacelessness, you know, there's a very interesting work by Mark Ogg, uh, A-U-G-E, uh, called Oblivion. It's an essay in French, but I think there are uh, uh, translations available, where Ogg talks about, uh, A-U-G-E, Ogg, he talks about the idea of no place or no time, right? And he uses actually certain real examples, uh, some liminal space times, uh, for example, the airport. Uh, for example, the escalator in a supermarket, right? So these are spaces which connect you to other spaces, right? So these, these are spaces where your sense of time is a suspended sense of time, where you're traveling to somewhere from somewhere, right? So in a certain sense, this becomes timeless and spaceless. Now, interestingly, Org says that a large part of super modernity, the way he calls it, super modernity actually relies on its no places. Uh, at a very foundational way, at a very architectural way, because the index of super modernity is how many malls can you make, how many airports can you make, how many escalators can you make, right? So this liminal space actually become more important in a certain sense. So I think it's a fantastic question because Ock's anthropological idea of memory, 
uh, through super modernity, escalators, shopping malls, uh, airports, airport terminals, etc. This fluid space times, uh, these actually become a very key category in urban geography today. So I think that's a very central question. The idea of timelessness and spacelessness as real conditions, not just fictional conditions, as real conditions. So thank you for those questions. Wonderful. Yes, uh, so uh, there's, uh, there's, uh, actually, I'm just one, trying, yeah, just one, one sec, one sec. Could I, could I? Yes, yes, yes. Just, just respond to this, yeah. Uh, actually, I'm trying to connect my research with yours, which I have also tried to do when I went to Gohati, if you remember. So, uh, when you talk about timelessness, actually, I was thinking of how cognition connects with spiritual science and physics. Like, uh, see, I mean, in the process of uh, acquiring any kind of spiritual vision or something like that, uh, you can relate that to the crossing of planes through multiverses. I mean, that's there very much in uh, Upanishads, in Gita also, and also in any kind of philosophical discourse where, uh, you know, Einstein comes very close to Indian philosophy when he's talking about the wormhole and the, you know, the white hole. So this takes you to different planes of reality and different planes of memory which could be in the past and which could also be in the future. And you have a lot of sci-fi engagement with this concept uh, where actually the theories are still in the philosophical realm and it has not been proved in science. You see, and so that is the dimension of memory which I am engaged in, uh, which is very different from yours, but this could also be related to memory which is not necessarily past which is not necessarily you know uh, connecting with uh, the spacelessness as we have here in uh, anthropological geography in this world but a sense of reality which is more real perhaps than this reality that we observe and i was talking about regressive yeah. memory one sec yeah. regressive memory if you uh, read through many masters and many lives where Brian Weiss is, you know, taking up uh, his subject, this uh, uh, lady in question or this girl in question, uh, who actually remembers the, you know, the crucial points in her past lives where she faced trauma and which has created a psychological blockage. And when she is in a trance, she talks about those moments. And when she wakes up, she completely forgets. But uh, that's the recorded version which Brian Weiss uh, keeps with himself which helps him to analyze. And what he realizes is that each time she talks about it, uh, she actually gets cured of that particular blockage. So there are many multiple lives that she has crossed through. Uh, and she talks about this white light and the masters coming and things like that. So that is also, you know, connecting with the multiple planes of existence or past lives or something which kind of proves that there there are something called past lives, which is not just nonsense, which is not a fictitious kind of a version. So that's how, you know, my research is connecting with yours, taking another dimension in memory studies and uh, I thought that I would just talk about it. So if you can, you know, talk about it or maybe a little bit, or maybe you can think on those lines and we can take up this discussion later. That sure. would be wonderful. Sure. I, I mean, I think this is not actually that different. I mean, these are connected categories because since the beginning of memory studies, since the beginning of psychology, uh, the engagement with the alternate reality has always been there. I mean, so I think uh, if we see the works of William James, for instance, even Freud, and then, you know, even people like Damasio today, or Kendall, or Ledoux, they're increasingly interested in philosophy, they're increasingly interested in the idea of the self. I mean, Damasio's got a book called The, uh, the Self Comes to Mind. I think this is a hardcore neuroscientist who might win the Nobel Prize any day. And it's talking about the self and the mind as very philosophical categories, as very fluid categories. So I think there's a law of convergence, which has always been there. It's not a new thing. It's always been there since the beginning uh, of, you know, this engagement with the mind and cognition, and which is getting perhaps more systematized today uh, in the works of neuroscientists. I mean, for instance, if you read Kendall's work, it's got a book called a Memory from Mind to Molecules, where it talks about, you know, autobiography, talks about photography, talks about almost the, you know, things which you don't see, uh, but can feel. So there is that dimension, which I think has always been there as in this discourse. So yeah, I think that's a very interesting and happy overlap. 
of uh, you know research. Thank you. So uh, there are so many questions. Uh, I have a session at once, so maybe we can take two more. Or okay, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, the question is asked by Vishakashin. Has the time arrived when literature is synthesizing with AI, that is artificial intelligence? Oh, okay, that's a very good question. I, I make the argument, so we, you know, we work with some artificial intelligence people in IIT Madras, as well as XR Lab, TCS. I make the argument that literature has always been about artificial intelligence. Uh, a novel is perhaps the first instrument in augmented reality, uh, even before we had machines of augmented reality. What is a novel? A novel is about fictional reality. A novel is about making you see a world which we are away from, but making you experience it, making you feel it, making you move through it. When you read a novel or a poem or a drama, you're traveling in that world. You are looking at that world, although not belonging to it. So I think your question is, it's an excellent question. It's a beautiful question, but I think uh, literature's always been there. I mean, I think literature got there first. And uh, now what we call augmented reality is just a sophisticated machine version of what literature has always historically done. So yeah, thank you. Okay, so, so the last question uh, is by Omlina Parvin. The question is, sometimes we come to know that if a person is too much anxious, sensitive or emotional, then he or she has a weak personality and weak memory. Is it significant? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I'm not sure if I'm entirely qualified to comment because I'm not a clinical psychologist. My work on psychology is more the cognitive dimension rather than the clinical dimension. But from whatever little I've studied, uh, you know, this whole idea of equating weakness with anxiety. I mean, yes, I mean, anxiety obviously is a nervous condition. Uh, you know, there's more electrochemical transmission and that makes it hyperactive, etc. But the question, and it's a very good question because that equation with weakness and anxiety is very problematic because that very quickly spills over into certain other binaries, male, female, white, non-white. Uh, it takes up gender, racial qualities. I mean, I'm sure you're entirely aware of how hysteria uh, as a disease uh, was very conveniently gendered for the longest time, right? Only women could be hysterics. And it was very crudely equated with a womb. There's something which happens in the womb, so only women could become hysterics. Now, interestingly, uh, what happened in the First World War, uh, when soldiers came back from the war and began to behave like quote-unquote hysterics, uh, the medical dictionary had to be redefined because, you know, we can't call men hysterics because obviously hysterics only are women by default. That's the sexist understanding of hysteria. So medical terminology had to come up with a quick term called shell shock uh, to give a name to the male, you know, victims of nervous disease. So I think uh, it's a different debate to be had whether, you know, anxiety makes us weakness. I mean, there's also a debate that anxiety makes us more creative. But there's also that theory that anxiety can make us more hyperactive. Uh, a lot of art can happen out of anxiety. You know, a lot of art can happen uh, out of this anxious state of representation. But I think I'll be a little careful in using the word weakness uh, relating to anxiety because, you know, that connection has been historically there and used and misused to different kind of discursive, uh, you know, categories. So but it's a very valid question. Uh, but. Uh, I think there are two ways of looking at it. Anxiety makes you hyperactive and then, you know, you can consume more information and it produces more art form. There's a possibility. And also it obviously can lead on to certain clinical conditions. Uh, but I would avoid the term weakness uh, in defining anxiety. But thank you for that question. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. So can we share your mail ID with the participants? Because they yeah, did the one by all means, to by ask all you questions after. Uh, Absolutely, by all means. And those of you who are in uh, social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, would also know we are launching the INMS on 16th June. Uh, it's a free event for registration, so please feel free to attend it and register for it. We have someone called Astrid Errol, one of the biggest names in memory studies, and Hannah Teichler, who is the president of Memory Studies Foundation. And, you know, we are very, very welcome to attend the event. And right after that, we will start a membership program for INMS, which again will be entirely free. So I welcome you all to get in touch with me and just follow social media for this. But yeah, very, very welcome to email me. Okay, that's great. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for your engrossing, enlightening lecture. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, so now, well, I should again uh, thank Shakti Paul for inviting me and I laud him for his phenomenal scholarly work as well as for the cultural work that he does. 
I admire him a lot, and I think he's a very, very key cultural figure. I look at him more as a cultural figure, uh, as well as an academic. So all the best to you, Shakti. More power to you, and we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, everyone, uh, for being here. Now we are taking a lunch break. And we will be back at 3.30 p.m. again for the second session. Thank you, everyone.